Hello and welcome back to my channel, Quirky What If. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the first part of our series, What If Deku Becomes Hexblade Hero? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Skeptical One from Fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Izuku never knew a handshake could be so ominous. Then again most handshakes didn't come from the strangely warm hand of a walking hole in the universe, its eyes literal stars glowing brightly against the speckled black of its body, clouds of stardust flowing across its torso and arms. To make the simple action more odd, time seemed to stand still around the two in the wrecked museum, Izuku's middle school class frozen in various states of shock. Fear and burning rage in one case as a bullheaded villain destroyed hundreds of years of history or would have been destroying if he could move. Our covenant has been sealed. The being's voice echoed deep within the bowls of Izuku's soul, almost causing the boy to flinch, the both of us have much to learn. And with that, Izuku blinked blearily finding himself back on the floor laying on a pile of shattered glass and metal. What was once an ancient sword was fragmented beneath him and embedded in his arm. Take a piece. The boy had enough sense to pocket a decently sized chunk of the ruined blade, even as the minotaur villain raged around the room, knocking over displays and people alike. Think I'm not good enough to work here. The bestial man bellowed as he knocked over a suit of armor, I'll show you. Izuku looked around the room as he tried to clear his head, slowly pulling himself up when he spotted a fellow student nearby, his desire to help others overpowering his hazy state of mind. Look up. The teen did as he was told, spotting a decorative chandelier above the circular room. Pay close attention. Izuku watched wide-eyed as a hand, almost completely invisible, formed at the top of the chandelier. The hand moved and grasped a piece at the top of the glass decoration. Now pull. The curly green-haired teen realized with a gasp he could control the hand and did as the voice asked without thought, pulling a thin metal rod from the ornate decor. For a moment, nothing happened. Then the minotaur roared, and the mass of molded glass and metal silently dropped on top of the raging villain, the impact kicking up a cloud of dust and dirt, obscuring Izuku's vision. The teen took a moment to marvel at the power he felt from the small act of magic, only for it to come crashing to a halt when the possible consequences of his actions occurred to him, and panic set in. Izuku's head jerked up as he strained to see through the clearing dust, each moment building the boy's anxiety. He was vaguely aware of the fact that most everyone in the room had tried to get as far away from the Minotaur as physically possible, and said villain had been alone at the epicenter of the fallen decor's impact. Izuku was starting to hyperventilate. What if he had maimed the villain? What if they were trapped under all that glass and metal bleeding out? All Might would reject him as a successor if he found out Izuku had accidentally killed. The swearing of the Minotaur almost sounded like music to Izuku's ears, the villain was still alive, and well enough to throw a tantrum if the sound of glass and metal grinding against stone was anything to go by. The green-haired boy slumped against the wall behind him, his pulse racing in his ears. He had almost just killed someone. That's not how heroes are supposed to act. Heroes are supposed to subdue him. And now comes the second part of our lesson. What? Izuku thought with a flinch, unused to mental communications. I have given a sliver of my power, I do not give my blessings for free. The voice ominously echoed. Izuku gulped, hoping no one would notice the blood draining from his face, you want me to give you something. Yes boy, knowledge for knowledge. An equivocal exchange if you will. Izuku hated how the voice seemed to come from just behind his ear, a whisper but plenty loud enough. What do you want? Izuku shakily asked after a moment. The voice was silent for a moment. A bagel. Izuku sat stunned for a moment. A what? A bagel, preferably an everything bagel. Izuku blinked as he tried to process the request. If you do not believe you can provide me such an offering, then speak now. No, I'll be able to. Izuku quickly responded, it just seems like an odd request. I haven't seen your plane in well over a millennia, I have a long list of items I've heard about from my associates, and I wish to start checking those items off it as soon as possible. How long do I have to get you your bagel? Izuku asked, his breathing starting to stabilize. A day should be more than enough time. Izuku sighed as he hefted himself to his feet, he remembered seeing a food court somewhere in the museum. He'd see if they had any bagels there, and maybe no one would look too closely at his injuries. It would be just his luck for something as trivial as that to stop him from getting a damn bagel. I have the feeling the weirdest part of this deal is going to be your demands, isn't it? You humans are entertaining when confused. Izuku's shoulders sagged at his patron's chuckle. So, yesterday you made a deal with some eldritch being during the attack on the museum your class went on a trip to. All Might sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose, currently in his deflated form and trying to fight off a migraine from his green-haired student's predicament. The sun was setting on the pair as they finished their routine work on the trash Dagaba Municipal Beach Park, the last rays of the day casting the skeletal man in an almost ghastly light. The beach was significantly cleaner than it had been two weeks ago thanks to Izuku's hard work, but it was still a mess. Yes, sir, Izuku muttered, unsure of how his teacher was going to react. 
The teen nervously picked at his bandaged arm as he avoided looking the pro-hero in the face. Shit. The symbol of peace leaned his head back against his truck, the bed of which was stacked with a large amount of trash. Funnily enough, this isn't the weirdest thing I've dealt with in my life. Ah, really? Izuku recoiled in shock, not expecting such a nonchalant answer. Kid, there's a lady who can grow into the size of a skyscraper, and the number two hero is a walking pyrotechnics team. All might explain neutrally, and that's on the normal side of the spectrum. But those are quirks, biologically phenomena. Izuku sputtered, scientifically explainable occurrences in DNA brought about by evolution, not some eldritch being that exists on another plane. I'd be offended if this wasn't funny. Said eldritch being voiced its two cents as Izuku's rant evolved into muttering. All Might placed his hand on the muttering boy's shoulder, snapping him out of the small trance. Kid, when you've been a hero as long as I have, the blonde took a breath as he rapidly expanded and continued in a shout, you see some shit. Now let's get this trash properly disposed of. The hero shouted encouragingly before deflating back to his sickly form with a bloody cough. Izuku blinked as his mind still tried to process the conversation. We can debate what to do about your pack tomorrow. Isn't this something that should be dealt with as soon as possible? Izuku asked as he slid into the passenger side of his idol's truck. Well, you were fine with waiting a day to tell me about it. All Might muttered as he started the vehicle, so it can wait till tomorrow when you start moving the heavy stuff. Izuku gulped at the prospect of moving what his idol considered heavy stuff, his scrawny arms barely able to stand the current weight of trash. Besides, you said its demands for offerings have been pretty benign so far, right? It's only demanded one thing from me so far though, what if it wants something extreme? The boy tried to reason. I have pronouns you know. Izuku's patron echoed in his mind. And what are they? Izuku made the mistake of asking, regretting it immediately as a high-pitched ringing echoed from the base of his spine, accompanied by what sounded like a bass-boosted air horn resonating in his sinus. The whole experience felt like it lasted for several minutes to Izuku, but a quick glance at the truck's clock revealed the event hadn't even been a one. Do you have anything I can pronounce? Izuku asked hesitantly. My friends call me thou whom agony is time. The voice happily replied. You have friends. Izuku couldn't stop himself from thinking the insulting question. All right, one friend and several acquaintances. The eldritch void seemed to either miss the accidental insult or ignore it. And yes, I know it's a mouthful. We'll deal with the offerings as they come. You said he seemed to be willing to negotiate on what he wants as well. All might continue. Oblivious of the conversation occurring in the seat next to him, try getting that list he mentioned, then we can prepare somewhat. But Izuku tried to raise another point, only for All Might's calloused hand to cut him off with a pat on the back. Relax, everything will work out. The hero said encouragingly, why? Because I am here. The hero shouted expanding into his buff form again, causing the car to jerk to his side due to the change in weight. Speaking of offerings, Izuku paled slightly at the segue from his mental hitchhiker. I want a red ink pen. Izuku slumped forward, letting his face fall into his hands. I promise to teach you something really cool. Now whom agony as time tried to sweeten the pot so to speak, causing Izuku to groan. Young Midoriya, are you not feeling well? All Might asked in an almost fatherly tone, seeming more concerned about this than the prospect that his pupil may have accidentally sold his soul. You didn't sell your soul, only your privacy rights. Izuku's patron said entirely too cheerfully. Are you ready for lesson number two? Thou whom agony as time shouted as Izuku's dream deteriorated around the wound in space. But I need to sleep. Izuku tried to argue as his patron grabbed him by his shirt collar and started dragging him. Don't worry, you're still asleep. The walking wound in space tried to placate. This is all a dream. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to. The sealed god popped off cheerfully. Ask me nicely and I'll teach you a spell to do this with other people later. If this is a dream, why are you dragging me? Izuku asked as he started to calm down slightly, his patron still dragging him to god knows where. I thought it would be funny. Izuku chose not to dignify the poor justification, content to let himself be dragged around the undefinable void he found himself in. You said you're going to teach me something, right? Izuku asked after a moment of silence, resigning himself to the coming events. Oh, right. The eldritch being let go of Izuku, causing the teen to drop to the floor. In our last lesson I taught you one of the most simple types of spell. A cantrip known as Mage Hand, thou whom agony as time lectured pulling a chalkboard out of the depths of Izuku's dreamscape, even in your current condition, you should be able to use this spell repeatedly with little to no problems. Izuku chose not to react to his patron's jab, watching as he began drawing simple and complex diagrams at a rate faster than should have been reasonable. At your current skill level you should be able to learn and use another cantrip easily enough, the being turned to look at Izuku, that'll be your next lesson, think of this lesson as an introduction to magic theory and practice. If I were to assign you an arbitrary number for your skills using my blessed power, Izuku marveled at his patron's humility, I'd say you're close to being level 1 out of 20. Before Izuku could ask for a comparison for those numbers to mean anything, his patron decided to give him just that. To give an example, when you get to around level 10, you should be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything that could destroy a country. Izuku gulped, almost afraid to voice the question rising in his throat. Luckily, or unluckily depending on how it's looked at, Izuku's patron seemed to know what the teen was debating on asking. 
If you ever manage to make it to level 20, you'd be powerful enough to affect the whole world. Now Humagani is time time turned away from Izuku as he continued drawing diagrams on his chalkboard, which seemed to expand the more the being used it. I plan on you being at least level 6 before you enter that academy you're striving for, strong enough to defend or destroy a city. Isn't that a little excessive? Izuku cried in worry. I ain't gonna deal with no pussy shit. I've been mocked by my acquaintances for the last several millennia for being sealed in a weapon on this plane. My return needs to make a splash. Izuku's patron said straight-faced, We'll slow down once your school year starts up if you're worried about overloading on this. Izuku somewhat relaxed at the promise despite still being apprehensive about the whole deal. Besides, you're aiming to be the next symbol of peace, right? The Eldritch being asked with finger quotations. You should appreciate the power boost, even if I exaggerated the examples a little bit. How am I even going to explain this? Someone's going to know something's up when I show up doing magic after spending my entire life quirkless. Izuku muttered, sulking somewhat at his patron's mocking of his dream, missing over the latter half of the being's statement. As a quirk, duh, that doesn't help. Izuku shouted. Now whom agony is time shrugged, not my problem, work it out with all might. Be but. Izuku sputtered, searching for words. No buts. The wound, in reality, cut the green-haired teen off. Now that we've covered the basics, we can move on to lesson three. Izuku only had a moment to glance over his patron's writings, eyes widening at the abundance of magic theory on the board, before almost letting out a shout of surprise as his patron flipped the entire thing over revealing a blank side. I didn't get all that. Izuku cried. He actually hadn't gotten much of it at all, having been stuck on the multiple schools of magic segment on the board. Now we're going to learn a personal favorite cantrip of mine, Eldritch Blast. The Eldritch being's glowing eyes danced with glee as it ignored the anxiousness filling his impromptu student's eyes, as well as his verbal outcry then will cover the shit only I can give you. I'm not going to sleep tonight, am I? Izuku resigned himself further to his situation. That's the beauty kid, you're already asleep. Izuku bit back a groan at his growing migraine. Yue. Izuku thought in awe as he gazed up at the towering testing building, its gilded letters shining in the morning sunlight. I can't believe I'm standing here. I can't believe All Might made you eat his hair. Izuku's patron butted into the teen's train of thought, ten months of blood, sweat, and tears, and he makes you eat a piece of hair without having the decency to tell you how to use the power. We almost didn't clean the beach up in time, I'm lucky to have this power at all. Izuku started walking towards the entrance, how else was he supposed to pass it on anyway? Blood, the patron suggested casually. Izuku stopped at his patron's suggestion. The sad part is, I don't know if you're joking or not. If I was joking I would have said something to make you blush, like semen or saliva. The eldritch being said neutrally, blood probably would have digested quicker as well. Izuku fought back the bile in his throat at how his patron sounded almost. Earnest about the topic. Although if we're going that route, a blood transfusion might be even better. Assuming your body doesn't reject it. Can we change the subject? Izuku almost begged. Sure, blonde bombshell on your six. Izuku blinked in confusion, turning to look behind a moment later. Move or I'll burn your ass to the ground. Kastuki Bakugo growled when Izuku made the unfortunate decision to meet his eyes. Izuku yelped out an instinctual apology as he jumped to the side, the angry blonde passing by without offering the green-haired boy a second glance. Huh, he was awfully nice, Izuku muttered. That was nice. Thou whom agony is time asked incredulously, hey, do me a favor. Take a deep breath through your nose. Okay. Izuku mentally shrugged before doing what was requested from him. He felt the tendrils of his patron slither through his mind and pluck the memory of the action. What was that for? Izuku could feel his patron smile, a truly genuine smile. The smile of nostalgia a parent gets when they find old photos of their children. It sent chills down the teen's spine. Your friend smells of wolves. I'll deal with that later, now I need focus on what's in front of me. Izuku thought as he shook the bizarre conversation from his head, a glint of determination shining in his eyes. He took a mighty step forward, more than ready to begin the long journey of a thousand miles before him, ready to endure all the hardship and pain he would soon face, only to promptly trip on his second step and begin to fall forward. Well, I guess this is it. I really am a failure. Izuku lamented as he fell forward. I'm sorry mom, I guess I wasn't cut out to be a hero after all. Izuku, I'm sorry all might, all of our training will go to waste and you'll have to find a new successor. Izuku, I'm sorry Kachin, you were always right about me. I'm just a failure who should jump off a bill. Izuku, pay a fucking T-T-E-N-T-I-O-N. Izuku's patron shouted. What? Izuku returned the shout only to notice that not only was he no longer falling, he was standing upright, with a very cute and very concerned girl standing in front of him waving a hand in his face trying to get a response. Oh thank god. The cute girl said when she saw the green hair boy focus on her, placing a hand on her chest, her rosy cheeks framed by her floofy hair. I saw you about to fall and used my quirk to stop you, but then you didn't seem to be reacting to anything and started to freak a little. Izuku watched fascinated as she touched the tips of her fingers together, and the weight Izuku didn't notice was missing returned. Sorry about using my quirk on you without permission, by the way, I figured it would be bad luck if you fell right before the test. Well, good luck. 
the girl cheerfully called over her shoulder as she sprinted for the entrance, leaving Izuku in a stunned silence. I talked to a girl. Izuku suddenly squealed mentally. I really need to let you talk to my friend if you think that was talking to a girl. Your friend's a girl. Izuku asked as he briskly walked towards the entrance, his patron having been stingy on their personal details throughout their brief partnership. No, she's actually Izuku's knees almost buckled as his lungs, liver, and larynx all vibrated at a low F sharp, his teeth and skull pounding like an African war drum, but I guess referring to her as a her is the closest you'll get in your pathetic language. Good to know. Izuku grimaced as he found his way to his seat, right next to his friend Bakugo. I believe the words you were looking for was bully or tormentor. Oh shut up, I need to actually pay attention. Bullshit. You read up on everything that you're about to hear today last night. They might have changed something. The boy meekly tried to defend himself. You have the power of me on your side, plus All Might's power is sitting somewhere inside of you. You're more than set to fuck up some robots. The boy blushed at the encouragement his patron was passive-aggressively saying. Seriously, you know two different ways to shoot magic out of your hands, one of which you can do as many times as you want, and those are the boring spells. Those, robots, are, fucked. I guess you might have a point. Izuku trailed off as he refocused on his surroundings, realizing that the entire room was looking at him, mainly a blue-haired boy with rectangular glasses. W what? Izuku managed to stutter out. If you're not going to pay attention and you insist on that inane muttering, then you shouldn't be here. He declared with a chopping motion of his hand, there are students who are trying to take this seriously. Eh sorry. Izuku shrunk into his seat. We really need to work on that mutter of yours. The eldritch deity threw its two cents in, and getting you a backbone, I've seen jellyfish with more spin than you. Just please shut up. Fine, the patron said dramatically, allowing the boy to focus on the remains of the pro hero's presentation. Oh shit it's present Mike. What the hell does he put in his hair and where can I get some? You have hair. Whenever I'm in the mood for it. The patron cryptically answered. How hard is it for you to find a robot to smash? Thou whom agony as time shouted at the frantically running teen, you have magic lasers, remember. It's not my fault other people are beating me to them. Izuku tried to counter. On your three o'clock, two feet away. Izuku's eyes widened as they locked onto the approaching machine. Did the square twat throw you off? He seems like a real stick in the mud. Izuku held up his fist, his thumb and index fingers pressed tightly against each other. Thundercall the boy's thought was interrupted by a dazzling light splitting through the air and shearing the robot's head off. Pardon me, was what the blonde boy who stole Izuku's point said when he looked at him. We make a good team don't you think? The flamboyant boy winked before sprinting off in the other direction, to bad it will be short-lived, au revoir. That kill-stealing son of a by the eldritch patron started to yell before Izuku cut him off, no time for that. But he Izuku cut them off again, I said no, I need points. Fine, on your left, there's an ally, about 20 feet away on the other end. The patron helpfully pointed out. And I demand a mango later for all the help I've given you today giving you. Thank you. Izuku sprinted towards the ally way, only taking a moment to look down at it and aim the charging magic in his hand. Eldritch Blast. The boy shouted as he flung his hand forward, two beams of spear-shaped crackling energy shooting down the ally like a bullet in the barrel of a gun before slamming into the robot he had been targeting and reducing it to shrapnel. A high-pitched deep echoed in Izuku's ears as he raced down the alley and into the hectic fight on the large street. The girl who had saved him from eating dirt looked at him in surprise from beside the smoking robot. Sorry, the boy called out as he raced to gather more points. Did you catch the number on that thing? Pretty sure it was one pointer. Damn it. Izuku swore as he whipped his head around, searching for more targets. Aware of each minute wasted was another minute he was closer to failing. Brace yourself. Now whom agony is time warned a few moments before the ground began to rumble beneath his feet. What Suzuku didn't have time to finish his question before he got his answer. The zero-point hazard robot had made its way into the mock city. What the Izuku started to think before his patron cut him off? No, allow me Izuku. Izuku heard his patron give a few soft calm coughs to clear his throat? What the fuck? The robot tore over the buildings, crushing any that it chose to rest its immense hands on. Despite the mecha size, it could move quickly. This fact proven a moment later by the punch that blurred into the street, kicking up a dust cloud that rivaled the height of the surrounding buildings. Izuku stood momentarily frozen in fear generated by the sheer magnitude of the machine before him. Most others were in a similar emotional state, only instead of being petrified by fear, their flight responses had kicked in. All right, here's our chance. Thou whom agony as time tried to seize the opportunity, while everyone else is being a bunch of pussies, will slip out and get some points. Izuku fell to his rear when someone's shoulder clipped him, much to his patron's displeasure. Come on, don't you want to pass? That jolted the boy from his fears, causing him to scramble to his feet, vaguely away of present Mike's time call of two minutes. Before the boy could move to search for straggling robots, something caught his attention. Though, a familiar feminine voice called out, causing Izuku to whip around to the source. His eyes landed on the pinned figure of the girl who helped him earlier that day and who he had also almost hurt with his only robot kill. We have to help her, Izuku cried out in his head. All right, well we can distract it with an eldritch blast and then use an unseen servant to help her, this would also be a good time to test out your new curse specter oh fuck we're moving. 
Izuku's patron had been in an analytical mumble not dissimilar to his servants when Izuku lunged forward and were in the air. Just picky. I'm sorry, my legs just moved on their own. Izuku apologized as tears began to form at the edges of his eyes. Speaking of legs, the pain hit Izuku like a truck, causing the tears to flow freely along with a hiss to escape his mouth. You managed to fracture your lower legs in three places, each. Is this the power of one for all? Izuku asked no one in particular. I think it is. Now would be a good time to mention that I toyed with your body a bit about two months ago. The elderts being informed casually. You what? Izuku shouted through the pain, just away enough to know that no one had probably heard him. We'll talk about that later, first take care of the big boy while we're here. It was then that Izuku noticed that he was roughly face level with the robot, and he had reached the peak of his leap. In that weightless moment, as gravity began to work its magic on Izuku, that the green-haired boy was struck with an idea. You're liable to kill yourself doing that you crazy bastard, go for it, the boy's patron laughed as he glimpsed the boy's mad idea. Izuku let the magic of an eldritch blast charge in his right hand, at the same time he channeled the now found one for all into the same arm. The boy cocked a limb back and roared a battle cry, Eldritch Smash. That is a shit name. Izuku's patron muttered as the sheer force of the punch crushed the head of the robot, and the charged magic caused the rest of it to be knocked clean off the neck of the titanic machine. Also you have two clean breaks on each of the bones in your lower arm. I can't believe that worked. I can't believe you're about to fall to your death. His patron cheerfully said, Oh yeah. Izuku thought as he looked down, vaguely aware of the burning in his right arm, any idea on how to get down safely. Unseen servant could try to catch you, the patron suggested. No, it's not strong enough, maybe I could punch the ground with my good arm and negate some of the impacts. Izuku reared his left arm back to do exactly that. How is that any more plausible than my suggestion? Because science. Izuku shouted as the ground grew uncomfortably close, here goes nothing. Detroit. The green-haired boy began to shout before a hand to the face interrupted him, and strangely enough, his fall. Release. The girl who had now saved Izuku twice shouted, causing him, and the platform she was on to fall to the ground. The brown-haired girl took several shaky breaths before turning to the side and releasing the contents of her stomach. So majestic. Thou whom agony as time marveled at the rainbow-colored puke that flowed from the young woman's mouth. I'm alive. Izuku mentally cried for joy, she stopped my fall. Yeah yeah, thank her later with dinner and a movie or something, you have points you still need to get. Frep. Izuku thought as he tried to pull himself forward with his left arm, ignoring his patron's teasing. How much time do I have? And time's up. Present Mike's call echoed throughout the ruined city, followed immediately by a storm siren to get everyone attention. Hey, don't pass out on me, was the last thing Izuku heard before he passed out. I mean you could definitely do vigilante work if your heart is that set on helping people. Now whom agony as time suggested as Izuku blankly stared at his fish. And if that doesn't work, you could become a bodyguard or something. Maybe a teacher. The green-haired teen ignored his patron, focusing almost all of his mental energy on not giving in to his anxiety. You do remember that you can temporarily sacrifice specific emotions to me, right? Thud. I'll take that as a no. Izuku took a deep breath as he felt the knot that had formed in his chest unravel, feeling significantly calmer but almost empty. Izuku, are you alright dear? Izuku hoped his flinch wasn't obvious. He was positive his mother had only barely bought his lie of his new quirk being energy manipulation. Said lie could very easily crumble if he didn't handle his dealings with his patron stealthily. Yeah mom, I'm good. The boy raised his head off the table and gave his mother a half-hearted smile. Your eyes are doing the thing again. She muttered softly. Izuku sighed, dreading what those words could mean. They're doing what I think they are. Yep, galaxy eyes in full effect. His patron giddily exclaimed happy to have some proper conversation again. How long till this wears off? The effect lasts 24 hours. The eldritch being thumbed through some of Izuku's older memories, his giddiness quickly giving way to boredom. If you were a lower level it would only last half that time. It's alright mom, I just figured out a new trick with my quirk is all. Izuku tried to casually explain, hoping she wouldn't ask for more details. The Midori matriarch seemed to infer her son's desire for the subject to be dropped. I know you're anxious about the results, but I just want you to know that, no matter what, I'm proud of you and love you. I know mom. The boy gave a genuine, if not weak, smile, I love you too. Mama's boy. Izuku's patron mocked, reminds me of my mom. You have a mother. Izuku asked as he resumed eating his meal. Again, approximate word. The patron sighed, but yeah, everything has to come from something. What's she like? Izuku asked, hoping to squeeze some information out of the eldritch being. Incredibly fluffy, very pink, and a giant lamb. The patron sounded almost defeated at the explanation. Honestly I don't know how she gave birth to me and my sister. You have a sister. Izuku came an inch too close to asking the question aloud due to his shock. Yeah, remember when I said I only had one friend. Thou whom agony as time sounded a little miffed at being interrupted. Yes, Izuku hesitantly answered. That's her, the patron said neutrally. Izuku was silent for a moment, unsure of how to respond. It sounds like you have a good relationship with her. The boy carefully worded his response, feeling he was treading dangerous ground. 
I'd hope so, we're both manifestations of the night deity, the deity said nonchalantly, in that same moment Izuku had made the unfortunate decision to take a sip of his drink. The resulting sputtering left the boy's shirt almost drenched and his poor mother almost in cardiac arrest from shock and worry. I'm fine mom, Izuku choked out in between a few coughs, just went down the wrong pipe. You're what? Izuku asked in shock, turning more of his attention to his patron. Yeah, I'm the embodiment of the night sky, where my sister is the embodiment of the moon in its phases. The deity explained as if he was talking about the weather, I guess you could also say I'm the masculine aspect of it while she's the feminine aspect. Why didn't you tell me you're a god earlier? Izuku would have stuttered if he weren't communicating through thought. Because I'm not. Thou whom agony is time said firmly, I'm half of one, closer to a demigod. Besides, my power's limited in this world because of this stupid sort of a prison. He muttered bitterly. Izuku sat in silence for a moment, face contorted in thought. Is there any way I can free you? Izuku asked after a moment. The patron's laugh was dark, wrapping Izuku's spine in an icy cloth. That is far beyond you, kid. The elders being chuckled darkly, the first step would be to reform or regrow my prison. All right, how do I do that? Izuku asked determined as he helped his mother clean up the remnants of their meal. You serious kid? The patron asked after a moment. Izuku nodded, immediately thankful that his mother had her back to him. It's a hero's job to help others after all. Izuku said happily, I knew there was something I liked about you. The eldritch being gave a hopeful smile, if you manage to do this, I'll owe big time. Izuku felt the patron pull back from his mind, give me some time to look into it, and I'll get us a list of what we need. Okay. Izuku weakly responded as he suddenly felt lightheaded, the presence of his patron having become an appreciated presence. Now what do I do? Izuku asked himself as he plopped on his couch, absent-mindedly going through various arm and hand workouts. I should probably send a thank you letter to recovery girl since I'm unlikely to see her ever again. Izuku. The green-haired teen's mother cried out, slamming the sliding door open. A letter was clutched in her hand as she hastily crawled forward on her other three limbs. It's for you. Izuku felt his heart drop when he processed what the wax insignia sealing the envelope stood for. His emotional sacrifice apparently only encapsulated the anxiety he had been feeling and not any of the fear or dread he would fear for the next 24 hours when it came to the topic of UA. Hey kid I'm ba why are you crying? Now whom agony is time asked in confusion as he turned his focus back onto his soul connection to the material plane, several hours having since passed on that level of reality. I got accepted into UA. Hizuku happily cried. How did you pull that off? The patron asked, deciding to respect the boy's privacy by not delving through his memories. Turns out they also graded based off of how heroic you were. Hizuku seemed to vibrate in place, confusing his mother slightly as the two were out getting ice cream and blowing up the zero-pointer net you enough of those to pass. No, it's more that I acted to save the girl from before rather than hunt for more points or run away. Izuku explained. So you really owe her dinner and a movie now is what I'm hearing. The eldritch being teased, enjoying the sight of the teenager going full Christmas mode with his red face and green hair. I eyed out that she want to go out with someone like me, she called me plain looking. Izuku managed to sputter out. When, you blew up a creature that would make a hill giant shit themselves and then passed out. The video that came in my letter had a clip where she tried to have some of her points transferred to me, she called me plain looking in that. Izuku glumly mumbled. Hey, sounds like you're already on her good side. It shouldn't be too hard to get her to want to jump your bones. The patron reasoned. You don't have any idea how a romantic relationship works, do you? Izuku deadpanned, trying to suppress his blush. Nope, on an unrelated note. Would you mind if I borrowed your body tonight? The patron did his best attempt at puppy dog eyes, which caused Izuku's brain to quiver to the same beat as Britney Spears' toxic. Why? Izuku tried to suppress his shiver at the sensation in his head. I think I figured out a way for me to control your body and you get a full night's rest. It would allow me to do more research in those wasted eight hours you spend sleeping. Will it interfere without nightly lessons? Shouldn't. It's one of the perks of being a multidimensional being. I can be in your dreams and in control of your body at the same time. We can try it tonight, but if I'm any less rested then we'll have to either drop it entirely or wait for special occasions to do it. The eldritch godling let out a joyful screech, which caused Izuku to feel like someone was using his spine to clean a chalkboard. Please never do that again. Izuku pleaded when he regained his bearings. Get me an avocado and you have yourself a deal. Fine. Izuku turned to his mother as the two walked through the busy evening market. Hey mom, do you know where we can get avocados? About damn time he finally talked to us, even if it was to tell us he's at that beach. Thou whom agony as time complained as Izuku raced down the street, heading to the location in question. To be fair, he explained that he was busy with paperwork and probably recording all those acceptance letters. Izuku reasoned. How long does it take to send a text though? He was probably just wanting it to be a surprise. Still seems like an asshole-ish thing to do. The godling grumbled as he approached the railings of the beach. There he is. Hi, oh might. 
Izuku shouted, little more than a meter away from the withered man. Shush, not so loud. All might reprimanded with a spurt of blood. That man must have a lot of blood in his body. Izuku patron must, he must be lucky or something that none of it ever seems to stain his clothes. Off over at the pier, the young couple sitting there seemed to have heard the teen shout. Hey, did someone say All Might's here? No way. Where? The other one shouted as the two began to look around frantically. Are you trying to blow my cover here, kid? All Might hissed, say it was a mistake. Izuku cringed at his mistake, before shouting in a very convincing manner, looks like I was wrong, nothing to see here. Awe, oh, one of the couple groaned at the lost opportunity. I wanted an autograph. The pouted. The two men waited a few minutes for the couple to wander off before they resumed their conversation. Good job on getting in, kid. All Might lifted his hand into a thumbs up. You got in there on your own merit. I wasn't a judge and I didn't tell anyone about training you. You getting in was 100% you. All Might congratulated the kid. What am I? Chopped liver. The teen's patron complained. What? Do you want me to correct my idol? Yes, actually. Then how much would you say you did to get me in? About a third of it, I've given you some of my power to use magic. Even if one for all boosted that power when you combine the two. Regardless, I still helped you. And I got you your mango for it, so we're even. I'd still like to be recognized. Thou who Megany is time pouted. All right, all right. Izuku mentally grumbled. While that means a lot coming from you, it wasn't all me. I have my patron, remember. Izuku politely corrected his teacher. Oh yeah, I forgot about it. All Might cringed slightly, having seen plenty of what the Eldritch being had taught his student after they concluded that there wasn't much they could do to resolve the situation. Speaking of forgetting about things, you never told me you were going to be teaching at UA. This year, Izuku flawlessly segued. It explained what brought you here with your agency being all the way over in Minato. That's kinda creepy kid. All Might grumbled, turning to look out at the starry night sky over the ocean. Besides, I was told to keep quiet about the job until the school made the official announcement. The job seemed like a good way to find a worthy successor. You have no idea how long I've been looking for someone to inherit my power. Kinda out of order, but he still passed his power on to a UA student. Izuku's patron grumbled through what sounded like a full mouth, the sound of crunching following a moment after. Are you eating popcorn? Izuku asked incredulously. Well no, but yes. More crunching followed the eldritch being's words. He still intended to pass his power on to someone else with a quirk though, someone who probably could have handled more than one punch without breaking their arm. Izuku thought sinking slightly into despair. My body isn't strong enough to endure one for all. Wait a couple of levels and I can juice up your body again, help acclimate it to the power of one for all. Thou whom agony as time tried to comfort the boy, causing him to cringe. We still haven't talked about how you modified my body without my permission. It was done in good faith. You'll learn to use the power of one for all in time. You wouldn't expect a baby to run a marathon now, would you? All Might tried to comfort the boy. Yeah, hold on, you knew I was going to wreck my body. Izuku accused the older man. We were on a time crunch, but it turned out all right. All Might awkwardly tried to explain, at least you now know what you're dealing with. The blonde reached down and picked up two cans. You're currently operating at all or nothing levels of power. In time, you'll be able to control it easily. So I just need control. Izuku smiled. Your body's barely able to contain the power at the moment, with training you'll be able to hold it better. All Might crushed the cans in his hand, having shifted into his buff form, and then it will be yours to command. Holly shitted as All Might. One half of the couple from earlier shouted, Sign my face. The other half shouted, the sounds of rapidly approaching footsteps growing steadily louder. And now we run. All Might shouted as he began to do just that, Izuku following behind a moment later. What do you think he's thinking about? Izuku must after a moment of the two sprinting down the beach side. Guns, horrible health insurance, oil, freedom. I don't know what Americans think about. All Might is actually native to Japan. Bullshit. This man screams the American dream, he's practically leaking patriotism and manifest destiny. I mean, he definitely does have some American traits. But I think he picked those up when he traveled in the United States. Do you think he owns a gun? Maybe. His patron was silent for a moment. I want a gun. No, I am not getting you a gun. Izuku tried to shut that train of thought down as quickly as possible. Fine, a sword. Izuku's brow furrowed in thought, what kind of sword? A claymore. The patron said to quickly for Izuku to feel comfortable. Maybe, but it would be easier to get you something smaller. In Japanese. Fine, an odachi. I will need a sword if I want to reform my prison anyways. The eldritch godling withdrew on the topic. Try asking All Might, he'd probably be willing to help. Hey, All Might. Izuku started meekly, earning the larger man's attention. My patron was wondering if you'd help me get a weapon for it. What? Like a gun? All Might boisterously asked. I'm not going to tell you I told you so. Shut up. Izuku hissed at his patron, actually a sword, more specifically an odachi. All Might gazed forward in thought. I'll try and pull some strings, how quickly does it want the sword? As soon as possible, but there's no rush. Thou whom agony is time answered, having listened through the boy's ears. Izuku quickly conveyed the information. I make no promises, All Might said grimly, but I'll try. Oh thank you All Might, I promise to make it up to you. Izuku said in a rush, barely managing to keep his tongue bite free. 
Hey kid, let me borrow your mouth for a minute. I'd like to thank the man myself. Oh, sure, Izuku verbally said, refocusing the symbol of peace's attention on the boy. You do me a great service, oh symbol of peace. Izuku felt his mouth painfully stretch as his patron warped it into a smile. I will owe you greatly if you successfully grant me this boon. Izuku felt the tendrils of his patron's control slither into the background of his mind, the eldritch being content with what it had said to the man. My boy, that is some freaky shit. All Might said as he repressed a shiver. I don't recommend letting it have control like that around your mother. Or often for that matter. Oh what would little Olme do, I'm sweet and innocent. Izuku's patron rebutted. To quote you, bullshit. Izuku thought, ignoring the tingling sensation that accompanied his patron's laughter. That is one big door, big enough for me to make a phallic joke if I wanted to. Thou whom agony as time commented as Izuku stared up at the imposing door that belonged to his homeroom, I'm sure it would please all the ladies. It's too early for this. Izuku gripped, knowing my luck Kachin and the guy with the glasses are going to be in my class. I'd say you jinxed yourself, but you just might be becoming genre savvy of shonen tropes or something. Didn't shonen jump shut down in the 2060s? Izuku thought as he procrastinated from opening the door, able to just barely hear the budding argument of the two people he really didn't want to see right now. I recognize that messy hair. A cheerfully bright voice called out from the end of the hall, earning Izuku's attention and cutting off his patron's response, falling boy. Quick, now's your chance. The eldritch being that was currently renting Izuku's head interjected, seduce her with your awkwardness. Oh my god she looks adorable. Izuku thought as he fought his rising blush, the brunette girl cheerfully bounced along continuing along on a one-sided conversation. Come on, she is literally talking about how cool you are right now. The patron groaned, you're making my job as a wingman needlessly hard. I never asked you to be my wingman. Izuku mentally cried as he hid his blushing face behind his hands, I don't need a wingman, I need to focus on school. Fine, be a good student that will develop into a functioning member of society. So I guess I should thank you. Izuku meekly squeaked out, unintentionally cutting off the brunette. What for? Achako tilted her head slightly in mild confusion. Well first off, for stopping my fall in the exam. Izuku seemed to be gathering some courage, and then going and talking to someone about giving me some of your points. Hey, how did you know about that? She raised a finger to her lips as her confusion grew. Izuku floundered for a moment, his confidence shattering quicker than an iPhone without a case. They, whom Izuku sputtered for a moment, they included a recording of you doing that in my acceptance letter. I don't know if I should feel creeped out or not, Achako muttered trying to suppress his shiver. Anyways, what do you think we're going to do today besides orientation? The cheerful girl pushed the classroom door open and led the blushing teen into the classroom. Any reply Izuku could have mustered was cut off by the gruff shouting of a familiar bombastic teen. And that's why I think you should just fuck off. Bakugo finished what seemed to have been a rather long-winded rant judging by his red face. The entire class was in a stunned silence as they stared at the blonde. How did you not hear any of that from outside? Thou whom agony as time sounded genuinely baffled. I don't know. Izuku absently responded as he tried to process the sight in front of him. Bakugo was standing on his desk, hands firmly in his pockets as he shouted down at the blue-haired teen who seemed to be stuck in the middle of both a cardiac arrest and an aneurysm. I still think you should have ripped him a new one when he tried to pull that intimidation shit a few weeks ago. And as I said before, that would likely get me kicked out of UA, before I even stepped foot in it. If you're going to spend your time trying to pick fights then you should leave. A tired monotone voice droned from behind Izuku, causing the young warlock to spin around and face the source of the noise. Welcome to UA. Yes here of course. What are you? Izuku's patron muttered as he looked through Izuku's eyes, staring at the cocoon man on the floor who was currently sucking the life out of a juice pack. It took eight seconds for all of you get quite, that is inefficient and wasteful. The man stood up and stepped out of his sleeping bag, I am Shoto Aizawa, your teacher. This man looks like a narcoleptic insomniac who's been crossfading with vodka and cocaine. Can you not right now? No, I cannot not. I cannot, however. Izuku sighed internally as he studied his exhausted-looking teacher. You do have a point, I swear I've seen him somewhere before though. The scruffy man reached into his bag and pulled out a set of school-issued gym clothes. Put these on, we've wasted enough time today. The entire class blinked at the man in confusion. I actually really like this guy, he's got a good vibe. The eldritch being said cheerfully. Really? Izuku asked, knowing he wasn't going to like his patron's answer. Yeah, he radiates doom and gloom energies. Of course, you would like that. Is that supposed to mean something? Izuku chose not to respond to that. Instead, he fell in line to retrieve his gym clothes and proceed to the locker rooms. Ah, Midoriya. A familiar voice caught Izuku's attention as he finished putting on his gym shirt. The green-haired teen turned and looked at the source, that being the blue-haired teen who Bakugo had been ranting at. My name is Tenyeda, and I've been meaning to congratulate you. What for? Izuku asked with a tilt of his head, blinking in surprise. You seem to gaze through and see the true meaning of the entrance exams, something even I wasn't even able to do. You are clearly the superior student. Ada seemed to look away in shame as Izuku tried to process what he assumed was a compliment. Just roll with it, kid, this guy seems like a stubborn square. Are you going to refer to him as anything other than a square? He dresses like a dad. And now I'm going to ignore you unless you have something helpful to say. 
Izuku thought as he focused back on reality and prepared to respond. You may not respond to my words but I know you will hear each and every one of them. The eldritch being cried out. Hida, Izuku was cut off by a tap on his shoulder. The green-haired teen turned and was met with the sight of a spiky head of bright red hair. We should probably get out there. The teen advised with a sharp-toothed smile. He's right, Aizawa-sensei seems to be one who doesn't dilly-dally. Hida nodded in agreement, spinning on one foot and marching out the locker room. Actually now that I think about it, he's definitely an automaton of some sort. Now whom agony as time mused, did some Warforge survive this long? Izuku sighed as he trailed behind his male classmates. A quirk test. Most everyone in class one is shouted in surprise, Achako following up with, but what about orientation? It's a waste of time, if you plan to become a hero then you need to start focusing on that as soon as possible, Aizawa said with his back to the students, contempt evident in his tone. Iwe isn't bound to those pointless traditions, the teachers here are allowed to run their classes however they choose to. I highly doubt that they are completely free to do whatever they want, I know from first-hand experience that you humans are way too easy to corrupt. Thou whom agony is time muttered between crunches of some snack food. Are you going to be like this the entire time I'm in Iwe? Izuku huffed as he tried to pay attention to his teacher, who had just turned to half-face the class. Yes, the patron said unapologetically. You all have been subjected to standardized tests for most of your lives, but never got to use your quirks. The half-dead-looking man lectured, raising a phone with several athletic-based categories listed on it. The government's still trying to perpetuate the myth that everyone born equally by suppressing those with power. It's irrational, he all but spat out, one day those in power will learn, but that day is not today. This guy is one bad day away from writing a manifesto that would make Karl Marx proud. Back Hugo, Aizawa tossed a ball to the bombastic blonde. You scored highest in the entrance exam. Throw this ball as far as you can use in your quirk. Hell yeah, the blonde excitedly said, enjoying the prospect of being allowed to blow something to high heaven and back. The teen swaggered into the Marx circle and wound his arm like a pitcher would, assuming a pitcher was aiming to kill an angel on a cloud somewhere. Die. The teen bellowed as he launched the ball forward, an explosion detonating at the last moment to add to the softball's forward momentum. 705.2 meters. Read the device in Aizawa's hand as he held it up to the class. What was your highest score in middle school, Bakugo? Aizawa looked to the blonde teen disinterestedly. Pretty sure it was 67 meters. Bakugo was grinning like a madman, more than happy with the number he had just received. Aizawa nodded, somehow making the action drip with apathy. If you want to know your potential as a pro hero then you'll need to know your physical limits. Aizawa droned, the crowd of students bursting into excited chatter as they realized that they could cut loose for once. This is going to be so fun. A pink-haired girl with curly horns and black and yellow eyes cheered from behind Izuku. So that's what a typhling and a phase offspring would look like. The eldritch being mused as Izuku turned to look at the energetic girl. Too bad I don't sense any magic coming from her. That would be a fun bag of issues to mess with. You're not going to tell me what a typhling and a fae are, are you? Izuku grumbled. I will if you get me a kumquat. What is it with you in demanding food? Would you like me to demand human sacrifices, or maybe hedonistic acts so that I can know the carnal pleasures you petty mortals experience? The patron asked in a far too serious tone. So what variety of kumquat would you like? Izuku quickly asked. Before his patron could respond, Aizawa decided that the class had been having entirely too much fun. Idiots. Aizawa's voice was low but cracked like thunder, silencing the entire class. You only have three years here to prepare and become heroes. Fun isn't something that should be remotely close to being on your mind. Izuku felt a chill dance down his spine as a grin split across his teacher's face. Let's up the ante, why don't we? You'll be competing in eight physical exams. Anyone who fails to meet my expectations will face immediate expulsion. The scarf man declared with a mad glint in his eyes. This isn't good. Izuku thought. The hell do you mean by that? Izuku's patron sounded nonplussed by the man's threat of expulsion. I can't use one for all in this, I don't have enough control. Izuku said as terror crept into his voice. Oh, if only you had some second source of power given to you by the sexiest, smartest, and charming of the otherworldly beings. The walking wound in space mocked, sounding genuinely offended. Izuku flinched at the tone, sorry. The team muttered. Your apology is accepted, on the condition, you get me season 14 of The Simpsons. You mean that American cartoon that's been running since before Quirks emerged? The 14th season of it, yes. Isn't it on its 300th season or something? Yes, and all of them are shit except the 14th. If you say so. Izuku turned his attention back to the real world only to be met with the terrifying sight of his teacher grinning madly at the class. Oh, by the way, he basically just told everyone that if they have a problem with his teaching method to shut the fuck up and go home. You're paraphrasing. Izuku accused as his nervousness began to get to him. That's not fair. Achako shouted from beside Izuku, it's the first day for crying out loud. You should have made your move, she's fucked now. 
the patron somberly lamented. Ten, you, not. Izuku tried to beat back his rising nerves, which his patron was not helping with in any way. Fair. Aizawa spat the word out as if it was poisonous. You think in a world with natural disasters, catastrophic accidents, corrupt leaders and power-hungry villains is dictated by fairness. The entire class leaned away from the ranting man. It's a hero's job to bring fair play into a world by combating such unfairness. If you want to be a pro hero you need to break through limits, endure the hardships that this school will force upon you and go beyond. Plus Ultra is this school's motto, and you'll need to embody it to survive. The man beckoned the class forward with a taunting finger, now, show me you deserve to be here. Hot damn that's some charisma. Now whom agony as time echoed the same sentiment of what Izuku was feeling, the burning flame of determination igniting in his chest again. Are you sure that's not heartburn? There was such a nice moment, and you ruined it. Izuku sighed. We've wasted enough time, let the games begin, Aizawa said replacing his mask of apathy. All right, how are we going to handle the 50-meter dash? Izuku inquired as he tried to psych himself up, and fight the growing dread that came with watching his classmates excel at the simple sprint. Hell if I know, none of the spells you've got really can boost your speed. Were you not just offended that I didn't remember that I can use your power for this? Yeah, but that's because you forgot you had access to it at all. Just like you forgot you could sacrifice emotions and feelings to me as well. How can that Izuku suddenly remembered the implications of what his patron said? You are one of the smartest dumb people I know. The patron grumbled as he happily consumed the offered emotions of his servant. Oh, that is some ripe despair. At least now I'm not limited by nerves oh god I'm racing with Bekugo. The teen had started to say in a relaxed manner before mentally shrieking. How the hell did you feel that? Not now, gotta focus on running. And run he did. 6.8 seconds. The bot happily cried as Izuku sprinted past it, severally lagging behind his childhood friend, Bully. Crap. What was the analogy that you used with All Might for using one for all, an egg in a microwave? Thou whom agony is time used as Izuku tried to focus the power of one for all. Yeah, why? How about you try focusing on that when you're not in a ride or die situation? And what do you suggest I do? Multiple hands are better than one. Izuku almost smacked himself with the grip test machine. The green-haired teen took a deep breath as he channeled the swirling magic that his patron had instilled in him, his pupils taking on the pattern of a starry night sky in the countryside. Mage hand, Izuku muttered under his breath, gently moving his off hand in a simple pattern. The teen felt the confirming mental link form between him and his conjured assistants. All right now just hold it right there, he commanded, feeling the ghostly touch of the disembodied hand by his own on the wide handle of the grip test machine, and squeeze. The teen squeezed with all his natural might, the conjured hand the following suit and adding its meager strength to the mix. Please be good. Izuku prayed. Hey, 70 kilograms isn't too bad. Izuku's patron tried encouraging the green-haired teen. Holy shit, you're a beast. A teen with cylinder elbows shouted in surprise as he looked up to the multi-armed giant. Hey everyone, this guy hit 540 kilograms. I'm screwed, aren't I? The green-haired teen hopelessly asked. Only if Aizawa grades on a curve, that guy probably is going to screw the entire average from being a show-off. Oh yeah, a big-lipped and big-muscled student shouted from across the room, while I hit 520. Make that two show-offs. This time, Izuku did not avoid hitting himself in the head with the grip machine. Any ideas for the long jump? Izuku thought as he watched Bakugo rocket across the sand pit. Are you fine with technical cheating? What? No. Izuku mentally shouted, mortified at the concept. Izuku Midoriya. Aizawa called him up to take his place. You have 15 seconds to change my mind. The teen hastily said. Use blink to flip into the ethereal plane and just run around the sand pit. The eldritch being explained calmly. Izuku rolled the idea around in his head as he took his spot at the end of the sand pit. Screw it. He thought when Aizawa blew the whistle for Izuku to jump. Blink. The teen stage whispered with a wave of his hand. Izuku tried to ignore the muffled outcry of his classmates as he disappeared, their grayscale bodies barely visible in his limited sight. I hate this place so much. Izuku thought as he ran around the sandbox as quickly as he could, each step pulling at the power that thou whom agony as time let flow through his soul. He didn't notice the shadowy figures dancing at the edge of his vision. He was within jumping distance of the other end of the pit when he felt the spell begin to fade. Then I have to risk it, he thought before he leapt with all of his natural might. At the apex of his leap, the spell failed and he was almost blinded by the crashing wave of colors flooding his vision. Sadly this sensory overload sent his landing strategy to hell as he tumbled across the ground. At least I did average in that. Izuku half-heartedly muttered to himself. Yeah, optimism. Izuku failed to notice the glare he received from a specific blonde who was half turned away from him. Anything for repeated sidesteps. Nothing but words of encouragement. Crep, watch your motherfucking language. Don't patronize me. How do you even score infinity on anything? Now whom agony as time cried in dismay as Ochako cheerfully skipped back into the throng of the crowd after her record-breaking ball throw. I'm screwed. I'm screwed. I'm Izuku felt something snap in his soul. So that's what happens if forcefully take your emotions. Should I be worried? Izuku asked not feeling worried in the slightest. In fact, he didn't feel any emotion at the moment. Should. Yes, are you going to be? 
No, the patron said nonchalantly, you might experience an emotional hangover when the effects wear off, I just broke your feelings trying to calm you down. How does that work? The teen asked neutrally, less talky, more thinky. How are you going to solve this conundrum before you? Izuku calmly walked up to his gothic teacher and strolled into the marked circle for his ball throw. I had the vague idea of just breaking my arm by throwing with one for all, but now that I'm able to think clearly and had a moment to process it, I think Aizawa is the erasing hero eraser head. Izuku stared at the ball in his hand for a moment. He probably would have erased my quirk and made me do it over again, which I would probably settle for breaking a finger then. I don't like you when you're like this, you take all the fun out of a situation and seem to gain precognizant abilities. The patron grumbled, you still haven't told me how you are going to solve this yet. Well, we already know what happens if we combine one for all with Eldritch Blast, right? I like where this is going, continue. What if I use it to supercharge an unseen servant? That sounds just dumb enough to work, you have my full support. Izuku smirked. Or more accurately, he let his patron use his mouth to smirk since he couldn't derive any pleasure from his plan getting greenlit. Izuku closed his eyes as he pulled on the power his patron provided him, and reached within himself for the power bestowed upon him by All Might, feeling the two energies mixing in a chaotic and deadly cocktail. Izuku raised his left hand slowly and with as much caution as he could muster, letting it drift through the air in the ancient symbol that had been dictated oh so long ago in a time long since forgotten thrice over. One for all, 100% unseen servant. He muttered under his breath as he felt the being in question appear into existence behind him, and a mental link forming between the two. And now we just have to style this. Izuku's patron chuckled as it showed Izuku an image of what it had in mind. Izuku's smirk grew wider as he let the power of one for all slip from his mental grip, allowing him to move normally again. The teen wound up his arm in much the same way Bakugo did when he first stepped up to the plate, and in the next moment, two things would happen. One, he would feel the dull thrum of one for all abruptly disappear from the background noise that had come to echo in his body. And two, he released the ball from his hand allowing gravity to carry it to the ground behind him. The moment after that was unseen due to the cloud of dust that was kicked up, but Izuku knew the ball hadn't touched the ground. Izuku's smirk almost split his face when heard the telltale beep of Aizawa's device having finished calculating the range of the throw. Izuku turned to face his teacher and felt his heart drop. Oh now of all times your emotions come back on. The eldritch godling raved and smacked something in Izuku's head as the boy was frozen by the look his teacher was giving him. The man's was hair floating as if he was submerged underwater, a hand clutched in a death grip on the scarf that he had wrapped around his neck. His eyes glowed a malevolent red which was only made worse by the raw emotion that was roaring through them. Anger, disbelief, and confusion rapidly switched places in the man's bloodshot eyes which seemed to pour into Izuku's soul. After a moment the man blinked and his hair fell back into place and the raw emotion faded from his eyes. 914.4 meters. He said in a measured monotone voice. What just happened? Someone asked from the crowd, having observed Aizawa's hair trick. I don't know, but I'm glad I didn't see his face. Another person replied. Why? Did you see Midoriya's face? He looked like he was about to shit a brick. Fair point. Izuku was vaguely aware of the background conversation as he took a shaky step forward and felt a piercing pain split through his head, bringing him to his knees. It was after a few shaky breaths that Izuku realized that there was a person on either side of him and they were talking in muffled worried tones. I'm fine, I'm fine. He muttered deliriously as he pulled himself shakily to his feet, silently accepting the help offered to him by Achako and Ida. Izuku looked up at his teacher who stared at him through narrowed eyes. I'm fine, I can keep going. Aizawa shrugged at the boy and turned back to the rest of the class to continue the lesson. Or at least he would have if a certain blonde hadn't taken the opportunity to try and jump the down green-haired boy. What the hell was that Izuku? Bakugo shouted as he sprinted at the boy, the threat of violence evident in his form. Izuku's muscles coiled as instinct took over, subconsciously channeling his patron's magic into his fingers in case he needed to defend himself and the two new friends the boy had made. Luckily for both boys, Bakugo was stopped by Aizawa in his plus-sized scarf. What the hell is this thing? Bakugo struggled against the bindings. It's a capture scarf made of carbon fiber and a metal alloy, back down. The teacher commanded, I'll be pissed if I have to deal with dry eyes because of you making me use my quirk. The teacher released the explosive blonde and started applying eye drops. Now stop wasting time, next person step up. Izuku sprinted past the simmering Bakugo Achako and Ida following closely behind due to the shakiness of his steps. Izuku prayed that his score in the softball throw would be enough to secure him a high enough position on the leaderboard to pass as he searched for his name on the ranking Aizawa had projected for the class to see. Izuku was positive his heart touched his toes when he spotted his name at the bottom of the list, taking a small amount of comfort in the fact that the score beside it meant that he was just a few points shy of being in the 19th spot. Maybe you did well enough to meet his expectations. The godling that lived in Izuku's head suggested that was the criteria after all. Yeah, maybe you're right. Izuku Midoriya, I want to speak with you. The rest of you can go home, there's a syllabus in the classroom. Never the fuck mind then. Izuku's patron summarized as everyone whipped their head to look at the green-haired boy. I could have sworn it was going to be a trick so that we would do our best. But I guess I was wrong. 
Izuku barely paid attention to the soft-spoken words of the tallest girl in the class. He waited for the rest of what he assumed were his former classmates to drift out of the schoolyard. When the last person finally left, Izuku resigned himself to facing his soon-to-be former teacher. Aizawa, I'm afraid I'm going to have to interfere if you have plans of dispelling this student. The familiar voice of All Might was a cold comfort for Izuku as the green-haired teen and exhausted teacher rounded the corner of the gym building. Who said I was expelling him? The teacher asked neutrally, causing joy to blossom in Izuku's chest as the teen snapped his head up to the teacher, since you're going to be teaching him, you might as well hear this. How did you manage to throw the ball that far after I erased your quirk? The dark teacher asked in a dangerously neutral tone, drowning the hope Izuku felt in a sea of despair. Izuku gulped and looked up at his mentor for guidance. All Might wearily sighed. If we're going to explain this, might as well let Nezu in on it as well. Oh, so we're just spilling secrets now. Thou whom agony is time angrily asked. To be fair, we were directly asked about this and All Might has a point. I still have the right to be miffed, you didn't even try to argue. I think All Might is making the right call on this. Fine. The eldritch godling huffed. All Might turned and started walking towards the principal's office, oblivious to Izuku's internal conflict. Aizawa followed All Might wordless, though with a lifted brow and Izuku lagged behind them after a moment's hesitation. Ah, Tashinori, Shota, a scarred rat, dog, thing, greeted with a smile as the two teachers plus student, walked in, All Might taking the opportunity to deflate. What can I do for you? Wait, I thought his name was Shoto, and who the hell is Tashinori? Thou whom agony is pain questioned. As Ewa's name is Shota, he told us that this morning, Izuku answered in a confused tone, and I'm assuming Tashinori is All Might's given name. No, I heard him say his name was Shoto. The elders being argued, who the hell would name their kid after a genre of pedo hentai? Remind me to check my internet history when we get home, I need to know if I should enable parental controls. Haha, incognito mode motherfucker. I figured that it would be easier if you knew about this as well. All Might turned to his successor, sorry for not asking you first, but I'm sure this will be better in the long run. Aye, it's no problem All Might. The young fanboy hastily replied. You rolled over quicker than a bowling ball down a lane. The eldritch being mocked bitterly. Ah, so I'm going to be let in on some secret. Nezu clapped his paws together, I'm going to assume it has something to do with young Midoriya here. Before Izuku could respond All Might cut in with a cough, that's why we're here, yes. He turned to the other two men, if one of you would like to explain. Aizawa stepped forward, Midoriya seems to be in possession of an emitter-type quirk, yet when I tried erasing his quirk he seemed to be still able to use it. The tired teacher turned to look down at the student, I was hoping to get answers in a quick manner, but All Might threw a wrench in that. I see, the tiny principal said with a nod, I would like to hear the explanation for this as well, it sounds most interesting. Izuku looked up to All Might, silently asking how much he should reveal. Tell them about your patron, kid. Izuku nodded at the implied stopping point, Aizawa must not be in the know then. He did say it was meant to be a secret, much like our arrangement. Izuku visibly flinched. I'm sorry. He tried. Apology accepted, it was more done for your protection than anything else. The mortals of your plane have already fucked me enough as they can. Then what were you so bitter about a few moments ago? I just wanted an apology, I would still like one from Mr. American Dream over there. You'll get one later. I guess I should start from the beginning, Izuku muttered, rubbing the back of his head. A few months ago there was a villain attack at a museum that my school was taking a trip to. Izuku started slowly after a moment of gathering his thoughts, pulling on the pouch that hung around his neck under his shirt as he continued, I was thrown into an ancient sword that apparently housed an otherworldly being. Izuku gingerly pulled the fragment of the blade out, barely registering that it seemed larger, I made a pact with it, power for allowing it to experience this plane of existence through me. I'm afraid that I'm going to need more proof than a sword fragment to believe your claim, young man. The panda rat thing said in a cheerful voice after a moment of silence, an ominous tone buried underneath. Tag me in. Is that a good idea? I promised to be on my best behavior, Scout's honor. The patron promised, plus you totally just admitted to stealing from a museum. He would like to talk to you, Izuku said after a moment of internal debate. You sure that's a good idea, kid? All might worriedly asked after being shocked into a bloody coughing fit. Okay, Nezu said looking up at Aizawa out of the corner of his non-scarred eye. Hell yeah. The eldritch being cried joyfully as Izuku let the godling take control of his body. Aizawa's hair shot up the moment Thou Whom Agony is Time took control of Izuku's body and jerked the teen's head hard enough to make it pop audibly. Greetings again, O symbol of peace. The eldritch godling spoke through Izuku's mouth, continuing to pop the teen's joints, causing All Might to shiver. And greetings to you, underground hero Shoto and speaking beast Nezu. You're really not going to admit you're wrong about the name, are you? This is a hill I will die on. Am I to assume that you are young Midoriya's patron? Nezu asked in a strained tone after a moment of studying Izuku's eyes, which had completely taken on the glowing aesthetic of the night sky. Aizawa's eyes narrowed in confusion and slight offense at being improperly named. Well, I'm not his mother. I thought you said you were going to be on your best behavior. I am. The fact that I haven't pet the rat dog yet should be evidence enough. Yes, I am the boy's patron. The eldritch continued, enjoying the sight of watching two pro heroes so on edge simply from his voice. 
You mortals once named me thou whom agony is time, and it is my power coursing through Izuku that you've been observing. So the boy doesn't have a quirk, Aizawa asked as he let his hair drop, rubbing his right eye but never looking away from the possessed Izuku. Oh no, he does. Your symbol of peace made sure of that. All Might's glare at the godling possessing his successor was hard enough to cut diamond, but he has been using my power more than his quirk, simply due to the fact that mine is safer on his body more often than not. Is that why he almost passed out after his ball throw? Aizawa asked through narrowed eyes, because that doesn't look safe to me. An unfortunate side effect of combining his unstable quirk with my power. The being brushed the comment aside, it could have been significantly worse. Are you willing to go into more details of your pact with the boy, or the nature of your being? Nezu asked taking the opportunity to reinsert himself into the conversation. The conversation. And if there is a way to break such a pact. The only way to break a pact is by death, and not even then. Did the Eldritch really need to almost split Izuku's mouth open with a sadistic smile? No. But he took great enjoyment in the unsettled look he received from the men present. And the other details will cost you if you want to know. You understand that as far as I'm concerned, you're a safety hazard. Nezu more stated than asked. Yes, I am a danger in much the same way living in Japan is a danger due to earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis. The patron tilted Izuku's head to an unnecessarily uncomfortable angle for some added flair. I'm afraid I am just something you will have to live with. Ah, but like all natural disasters we can have warning systems and plans in place to mitigate as much damage as possible, Nezu said, making sure to keep a mask in place. Yes, because you're able to affect an ancient deific force. Now whom agony is time deadpanned, I can offer you my word that I will not bring harm to your school and its inhabitants, as much good as that will mean to you. You're right, your word means very little to me, Nezu said bluntly. But I would like a little more reassurance that the threat you pose will be minimized. All right, this is boring now. Time to speed this along. Izuku's patron rose the teen's left hand and snapped his fingers, a thick and ancient book appearing in his fingers. How about a deal, a transaction of sorts? Thou whom agony is time stretched Izuku's right hand forward for a handshake. You let me and my servant be, and I'll give you the knowledge to hunt down those who might know how to restrain me. Are you implying that there are others who are like you? Nezu quirked a brow. Oh yes, gods and devils, angels and demons, and those in between. I can sense all of it thrumming in the background. Magic still flows strongly in this age, and very strongly in your class. The eldritch being had turned to look at Aizawa for the last part. I believe I have played enough of my cards, will you accept my deal? Nezu was silent for a moment before reaching out and grasping the teen's hand, the larger wrapping around the smaller completely. Just as I thought, your fur is soft as hell, the patron said before placing the book on Nezu's desk and retreated from Izuku's body. Izuku blinked blearily as he was abruptly thrown back into the pilot seat of his own body. Sorry about that, he's usually not like that. Aizawa raised a brow, and what is he usually like? An asshole, Izuku said without a hint of hesitation. Oh, you wound me, and you could have very well gotten me expelled. I believe that is enough for today, Izuku you are dismissed. Nezu said as he eyed the book he had yet to touch, I have a few words I would like to share with Aizawa and Toshinori. Why yes, sir. Izuku scrambled to the door, not bothering to turn back to Aizawa when he reminded the teen to grab a syllabus before leaving. That could have gone better. That could have gone worse too. Why did you have to try to scare my teachers? Boredom. I only get to control your body at night, I don't get anyone to talk to. What, do you want me to get you a social media or something? The eldritch being somehow managed to make its silence sound pleading. No, Izuku stated firmly. Please, no, please. Just as long as you don't do anything that's likely to get me in trouble. I wouldn't dream of it. Bullshit. And when, Tashinori, Nezu asked in a cheerful tone that promised anything but cheer, were you planning on telling me that one of our students was possessed by a Lovecraftian god? If it makes you feel better, it's not actually a god, it's half of one judging from what Izuku has told me. All Might weakly tried to placate. Strangely enough that doesn't make me feel better. All Might was sure that if Nezu had thumbs and had been holding something, he would have broken it. Also what did it mean when you made sure Izuku had a quirk, Aizawa asked through narrowed eyes. I'm going to beat the shit out of that thing the moment I get the opportunity to. All Might thought as he sighed, it's the nature of my quirk, I can pass it along to another. All Might raised a hand, cutting off a confused Aizawa before he had the chance to ask his question. We can talk about this later, we should probably focus more on the book it left us. All Might said reaching a bony hand out to pick up the ancient text, only for it to be slapped aside by a ruler. Forgive me All Might, but I think it would be rather foolish of us to just trust this otherworldly being in any measure without taking extreme caution beforehand, Nezu said with a small smile. It gave us its word that it didn't want to hurt us, it seems to be content being a passenger in young Midoriya's life. All Might reached for the book again, plus you seemed fine with making a deal with it in the first place. And again All Might's hand was stopped, this time by Aizawa. You don't seem to be taking the situation as serious as you should be All Might. The dark-haired teacher's voice tripped with annoyance. All Might reached with his other hand and swiftly picked up the ancient book. If this thing wanted us dead or harmed it had ample opportunity while controlling Midoriya, and none of us would have been able to stop it. If you insist on being reckless, I will not stop you All Might, Nezu spoke up after a moment. 
Aizawa let go of the blonde teacher's wrist with a glare, retreating a step back as All Might cracked open the book. The symbol of peace began slowly scanning the first few pages, slowly speeding up till he was frantically flipping the pages barely pausing for long enough to glance at each page. After a few moments of frantic page turning, All Might closed the book with a solemn thud. What did you make of it? Nezu asked after a few moments, during which All Might didn't raise his head to look at either of the two. I can't make heads or tails of it. All Might said dropping the book on Nezu's desk, the weight of it almost knocking some things off. Coded, Aizawa asked with a quirked brow. Another language perhaps. Nezu offered. No, the damn thing reads like a quantum physics textbook. All Might answered as he massaged his temples, nearly made my brain go numb. Ah, Nezu sympathized while Aizawa gave the blonde here a neutral stare of disappointment. The super genius Ronin reached forward and opened the book in front of him, quickly reading through the first several pages. Intriguing. The almost albino Rodin said after a minute of silence, in due time I think this could be rather useful information. Assuming it's true. He added after a moment. So, are we just going to leave this thing alone? Aizawa said trying to move the topic to something more immediate. Oh, heavens no. Nezu laughed. We'll be keeping a close eye on Midoriya, as well as the other students of 1A. Well if that will be all, all might turn to the door, hoping to escape as quickly as possible, I'll be taking my leave now. He was just about to grasp the door handle when Nezu spoke up, he never did answer me all might. The symbol of peace let out a defeated sigh as he turned to the principal. When were you planning on telling me about young Midoriya's situation? Menace rolled off the rodent, even with his cheerful tone. Shit, all might mentally cursed. Ah, uh, so a battle trial on the first day, huh? Izuku thought as he leaned back in his desk chair, looking up at the ceiling as he contemplated the schedule on the syllabus, I wonder what that will entail. Beating the shit out of each other probably. Thou whom agony is time added its two cents. I doubt it'll be that intense. Izuku grimaced. Izuku, they had a city wrecking robot in the exams. The patron deadpan I'm pretty sure they'll let you guys pummel each other simply for the laughs. I think you should give the administration a little credit. Izuku replied with a furrowed brow. I'd hold a higher opinion of your principal if he wasn't currently nose deep in the tome I gave him. The eldritch being chuckled. How would you know? Izuku asked. Besides what's in it? Magic is the answer to both, the patron cheerfully answered. Care to expand on that? Izuku asked after a moment of silence where he hoped his patron would explain further. The magic that makes up that book was weaved from my being. I'm aware of what's going on with that book at all times. The eldritch being explained, outside of that, it might as well be a history of magic for dumbass and beginner's guide to magic theory. That actually seems to be really generous of you. Izuku asked impressed, what's the catch? Again this day, you wound me, good sir. The patron moaned in mock offense. Izuku waited with a raised eyebrow. Rat boy will be begging for the second edition by the end of the month, if not the end of the week. And there was the answer Izuku was looking for. Should I be worried that you seem to have gotten my principal addicted to something? The only thing he'll be addicted to is the pursuit of knowledge. The patron's smile was easily apparent in his voice, and is there no nobler a cause than that? Be honest with me, will there be any negative repercussions from this? Nothing more than the favors he'll owe me, which I will probably use on speeding up my release or getting you into some good graces. The eldritch godling seemed to shrug, plus I just gave the smartest thing within the school access to magic. I just made your school a hell of a lot safer in the long run. Again, that seems to be awfully nice of you. Izuku idly thought. The boy barely had a moment's notice before he was dragged into his mind. Much like in his dreams, he stood in a void. The only other thing accompanying him was the form his patron seemed to prefer, that being a gaping hole in reality that allowed any and all who gazed into it to see alien star clusters and distant nebula. I am a selfish being Izuku, do not forget that. The godling reached a wispy hand up to Izuku's face and faintly brushed colder than possible fingers against the soft flesh. Everything I do is either for my benefit or my entertainment. I am also patient. Spending a millennium of eons trapped in a cage will do that to anyone. The wound in space pulled back its fingers much to Izuku's relief and held the whole version of the ancient blade that was its current prison. I was content to wait for this prison to break around me, you have offered a far quicker solution. The blade shattered into dust as the godling's form began to expand, you have sworn to me Izuku that you would free me of this prison, and I will do all in my power to hold you to your word. Thou whom agony is time echoed as its form filled Izuku's sight. And may the gods pity any who dare try and stop us, for I will have none. And as quickly as he had been taken from it, Izuku found himself in his desk chair blinking up at his ceiling. Okay, I believe you had a good reason for what you did. Izuku thought as he tried to calm his rapidly beating heart. Sorry for getting all serious, the godling apologized. Since you're likely to be in several fights tomorrow, you should familiarize yourself with certain abilities in the waking world. Like what? Izuku asked, glad to shift the conversation to something more manageable. Well, thou whom agony as time began, you should get used to how your hex blade feels in the waking world, and you haven't even attempted to use the cursed specters that I gave you. Izuku flinched as he remembered what a cursed specter was. I still don't think I'm comfortable with using the souls of those who died to fight for me. Izuku, the ones I'm letting you use willingly gave their souls to me. The patron tried to reason with the boy. I specifically chose them because they would be overjoyed at helping you in your cause. I don't know. The boy anxiously rubbed his arm. 
No one said you had to force them to fight, they can do more than spill blood. The patron said after a moment, there's always a use in an extra set of hands when helping others. You can always have them help in search and rescues, or escorting civilians to safe areas if need be. I guess you're right. Izuku relented after a moment of silence. What do I need to do again? The eldritch godling's chuckle was soft and almost comforting if it wasn't for the fact that it made Izuku's joints feel like they were filled with broken glass. Just focus, they're buried in my being. Call for them, and they will respond. Thou whom agony is time instructed. Once you've called on a spirit, it will be easier to call again later. Okay. Izuku let his head rest against the back of his chair as he let his focus dip into his patron's magic, feeling the almost cosmic energy flow around his spirit in a calm chaos. Hello? He called out. Silence. Hello? He called again. Again nothing. Hell something shifted. He could feel something peer deep into his being, far deeper than it had any right to. Hi. Izuku squeaked out, the unblinking gaze setting his nerves on edge. You found one, now just pull it out and you've done it. Now whom agony is time's voice echoed all around Izuku and resonated deep in his soul. Like this, Izuku hesitantly reached for what he assumed was the soul he was searching for and felt it latch onto his being like a drowning man would a life raft. The sensation was jarring enough to pull Izuku back to full awareness, lurching forward and gasping in his chair as he tried to catch his breath. Shock, two cold hands digging into my arm. Rising, rising, I'm awake. I can't breathe, I need to breathe. An unfamiliar male voice rapidly said, seeming to narrate Izuku's thoughts and feelings as it rubbed small circles in the boy's back. Surprise, fear, who's in my room, why is he touching me? The voice really did seem to be narrating Izuku's thoughts as the boy forced his lungs to work. I don't want to turn around, I need to turn around, not safe, not safe, not safe. Izuku pushed himself forward as he charged an eldritch blast in his hand, spinning around to face the intruder. Izuku was met with the sight of a tall and lanky boy a few years older than him standing behind his chair, gazing at him with pale blue eyes that sat almost hidden in a sunken face and obscured by a mop of blonde hair that dangled over his cheeks. If his large hat drooped any lower it too would hide his face. Confusion, he can't be too much older than me, how did he get in here? He looks sick. The boy rapidly spat out. Relax kid, this is your specter. Izuku's patron spoke after an almost record length of silence. He's barely older than me. Izuku cried out. His was a sad and early fate, but through you, he may be able to do the one thing he constantly wanted and help others. Thou whom agony his time sounded almost mournful. How did he die? Izuku asked after a hesitant moment. Ask him yourself, he still has his personality and memories. Izuku's eyes shot to the teen who stood too still in the middle of Izuku's room. W what's your name? Izuku stuttered, trying to maintain eye contact with the unblinking eyes of his guest. Cool, he said simply. Is that your surname or given name? Izuku asked with a nervous smile. It is my name. The blonde teen said as if that should have been plainly obvious. Izuku gulped. This guy was cryptically blunt. Is there anything you like to do? I like helping people, Cole said without a hint of hesitation. This is going to be a long night. Would it make you feel better if I told you he was like this before he gave his soul to me? Izuku's patron tried to add helpfully. Not really no. Though well, Katsuki was angry. He slammed his fist into his punching bag. This wasn't anything unusual mind you, the boy always held some level of anger in his heart at all times. Any and all types, from the flickering cinders of frustration to the scorching flame of his true anger. He slammed his fist harder into the bag of sand. Rage on the other thing was something Katsuki could say he rarely drew upon, able to count the number of times he used it outside of training on one hand. He always felt the rage, it was at the center of his being, the roaring inferno was always within easy reach just beyond the tips of his fingers. He struck the bag harder again. The last time he needed to draw on his rage was when that thing tried to take over his body. The punch he threw at the memory of the event had been a record one if the throbbing in his knuckles was anything to go by. To make matters worse that piece of literal shit had seemed to be highly resistant to his quirk if not immune. So any and all of his explosions had only succeeded in damaging the street around the two and setting it ablaze. Katsuki would never willingly admit the fact that the memory of that thing forcing its way into his body was the cause of several sleepless nights spent blooding his fists. And then he got involved. The chain on Katsuki's punching bag snapped as he struck it, sending it skidding across his family's workout room. Katsuki's breath came in deep labored breaths through clenched teeth. Somehow he had made it into UA. Against all odds, despite being a quirkless loser, the green-haired teen had shattered his dream of being the only one from their shit middle school to get into the best hero school in Japan. Katsuki's breath stopped as he realized the mistake in his internal rant. Izuku wasn't quirkless, and apparently never had been if his skills during the quirk apprehension test was anything to go by. The deceit set his blood to a frothing boil. He'd have to beat the shit out of Izuku the next time he'd see him. And he was sure he'd see him again soon. Katsuki moved to fix the punching bag, not finished with that part of his workout yet. His new teacher, Aizawa or something, had threatened to expel anyone who failed to meet his expectations and he had withheld Izuku after the rest of them had been dismissed. Katsuki slammed his fist into the bag of sand again, softer than before but still hard enough to send it swinging violently back. Something didn't sit right with Katsuki about the situation. 
Aizawa didn't seem to be the type to spare someone from the social embarrassment of an expulsion, and as much as it pained the explosive blonde to admit it, Izuku hadn't been the most egregious of the hopeful heroes. How that purple midget had been so brazen in his lecherous staring was almost enough to get his blood boiling in the same way his childhood friend did. For once in his life, Katsuki hoped Izuku had succeeded, succeeded in meeting his teacher's expectations, or at least succeeded in talking his way out of an expulsion. He didn't just hope, he prayed to his ancestors that Izuku would be in class for the battle trial tomorrow. It would make tearing him down all the sweeter if Katsuki could do it with his own two hands. Again, Katsuki slammed his fist into the worn punching bag and broke it off of its weary chain. Brett, if you break that thing, you're going to have to pay to fix it. The Bakugo matriarch shouted at her bombastic child as she entered the room, the towel over her shoulder, workout clothes, and a water bottle in hand showing her intentions. Shut up, you old hag. I know what I'm doing. Katsuki shouted back. You ungrateful child, show respect to your elders. Make me. Oh, it is on. Mitsuki cracked her knuckles as she gave a barbaric grin, her son meeting her grin with his own. He'd never admit it, but he did enjoy sparing with his mother. That was exhausting. Izuku audibly said as he slouched back in his desk chair, having released Cole's spirit back into the folds of his patron's magic. You said you gave me a few spirits to use, how many are there? Including Cole, there's three of them. His patron sounded pleased. What are you so happy about? Izuku asked in a playful tone. I can tell that Cole enjoyed tonight, I feel the emotions of all the souls that I hold. The patron hummed contently, his has been sulking in sorrow and regret for a long time, they all have been, but is more than the either two. What are the other two like? Oh don't ask me to spoil their fun, the godling chuckled goodnaturedly, I'll tell you that they're able to hold a conversation better far better than Cole and that's it. I'll save that for another day. Izuku sighed as he stood from his chair, now it's time for a shower and bed. One thing before I give you some privacy. Thou whom agony is time quickly interjected, I'd like you to try and manifest your hex blade. Alright, it's the same idea as in the dreams right. Yep, now get to it. Izuku smirked as he held his right hand out in a mostly closed fist, allowing some space in his palm as if he was holding a rod in his hand, and channeled the magic of his patron into his hand. Izuku placed his off hand over the hollow of his closed hand holding both outstretched in front of his chest and slowly pulled the two apart. As Izuku pulled his hands apart, a glowing beam of black energy formed, taking the shape of a large uchikatana. Fucking weeb. On Japanese. Oh yeah, I'll let it slide this time. Izuku scoffed playfully, smiling at his patron antics as he let go of the magic blade, causing it to disperse. Good night. Good night. Fascinating. Neza whispered to himself as he moved to jot down another intriguing bit of information on the notepad he held, only to come to realize he had reached the last bit of usable open space for yet another pad. This is ridiculous, Nezu thought as he forced himself up from his desk to search for any more available notepads, ignoring the series of clicks and cracks from his protesting joints that followed. How am I supposed to properly be able to document what I'm learning if I keep running out of paper? It was as the white rat was scavenging around his office that he spotted a clock. Good heavens, is it already 3 a.m.? My how the time flies. Now that he had stopped to think about it, Nezu recognized the burning in his eyes and exhaustion in his body were probably good signifiers to stop and go home for the night. But he had so much to learn from the marvelous book young Midoriya's patron had blessed him with, another hour couldn't hurt could it. He had just gotten to a chapter connecting the lineage of the gods, this could provide invaluable insight into the nature of thou whom agony is time. He'd finish one more chapter and then wrap it up for the night. Whether or not he had said approximately the same thing for each of the fifteen chapters he had finished was neither here nor there. Izuku's form slouched in front of his computer, face unhealthily close to the desktop screen, seemingly deeply engrossed in some article. His eyes were closed, but a gaseous mist that held star-like pinpricks in it hung over the boy's eyelids. Fuck. Thou whom agony is time almost shouted using his vessel's mouth. I forgot to do the eldritch whispering thing to the principal. At least Hierophant isn't here to mock me. The eldritch being sighed as he returned back to his article, these Frenchmen had a bloody as hell revolution. Being that repressed will do that to any man, brother dear, a feminine voice called from behind Izuku's chair. It's unhealthy to bottle it all up like they did, they just needed a release. Had Izuku been in control of his own body, or even vaguely aware of the situation he would have frozen at the sheer power radiating from behind him. For thou whom agony is time, it was nothing more than the presence of his sibling. The fuck do you want ho? He craned his head back to look at his sister. Who says I wanted anything? The rather human-looking woman said as she placed a black-gloved hand over her chest. Can't a big sister come and check on her baby brother? No, the hell do you want? The eldritch godling wasn't going to beat around the bush with his divine counterpart, and were the same age, so cut it out with the big sister crap. The pale woman pouted as she brushed a strand of glowing silver hair out of her pale face. Fine, I figured it was time I got me a servant if you got one after all this time. Fuck off, he's mine. Thou whom agony is time wrapped Izuku's arms around the boy's torso to emphasize his point. Settle down, I don't want your sloppy seconds, the dark-clad woman roughly placated. I was hoping you'd be a nice brother and keep an eye out for any candidates you'd think would get along with me. 
but I'm not nice. The eldritch being currently wearing Izuku as a full-body prosthetic asked. A moment later a video popping up on the teenager's computer screen featuring a montage of baby animals yawning and sneezing. Oh that's cute. The feminine eldritch being rolled her eyes. I'm just asking you to keep an eye out for catches. She turned to leave, oh, and give mom and dad a call. I bet they'd like to hear that you got a new servant after all these years. I'll think about calling mom. A frown tugged at the corner of Hierophant's mouth hearing the intentional exclusion, still must not be over it yet. Goodbye Agony. See you later Hierophant. And just as quickly thou whom Agony is time was the only eldritch being in the room again. Thou whom Agony is time gently drummed the fingers of Izuku's hand against the boy's desk, his other hand holding the teen's syllabus. Wonder what the odds are. Welp, time to make a call. The eldritch being shrugged Izuku's shoulders as it stopped drumming its fingers, instead lifting the hand up to the teen's head as if he was making a phone call using the thumb and pinky fingers. Yeah, hey Kali it's me. Thou whom agony is time spoke into the hand after a moment of silence. What do you mean who this is? The eldritch being recoiled in shock and offense, it's me, you know the better half of Ister. The godling went silent as he listened to the response, groaning after a moment. Thou whom agony is time, remember me. We met at Dionysus's polka party a few millennia ago, I'm the reason he no longer hosts those. Thou whom agony is time explained. Yes, this is Hierophant's sibling. He sighed, look, I was wanting to cash a favor. He went silent as he listened to the goddess's angry rapid-fire talking, face growing more agitated with each word. What do you mean you don't owe me anything? Do I need to remind you about what happened at the polka party? Again he listened to the goddess's rapid response, a face of smug satisfaction on his face. There you go, now about that favor. The goddess interrupted him as she seemed to enter a rant. Listen, it's not much. The godling tried to placate the goddess. I just want to know if the thing my servant is a part of tomorrow has any random chance involved, and if it does I just want to shift a couple of variables. Thou whom agony as time examined Izuku's well-kept nails as he waited for the goddess to answer his question. Oh, so that's who he was supposed to fight. The godling shrugged, think we can change a couple of people around. Izuku's mouth nearly split with the force of the smile thou whom agony as time made. Good, now here's how I want this to go. It chuckled through the boy's body. How do you think your class will react to you showing up? Izuku's patron asked as the teen entered the heroic academy. Hopefully, they won't look into it too much. Izuku groaned internally. We both know Katsuki is going to have a fucking meltdown. The eldritch godling deadpanned. You're probably right, but you don't have to say it. Izuku responded as he approached the massive classroom door again. Deku, a familiar high-pitched voice called from the end of the hallway, giving Izuku a strange case of deja vu, I didn't think I was going to get to see you again. Izuku froze up at the positive female attention, rigidly turning to face the approaching girl as his face slowly began to resemble a tomato. Why yeah, turns out Aizawa sensei just had a few questions for me. Izuku stuttered as he scratched the back of his head. Sounds like you dodged a bullet there Deku. The bubbly girl stopped in front of Izuku, offering a cheerful smile. Um, Izuku awkwardly searched for the right words, my name's not Deku. It's Izuku Midoriya. Oh, I'm sorry. Achako apologized sheepishly. That blonde boy yesterday called you that, so I thought it was your name. It's all right. It's just an insult he's used since we were kids, Izuku explained, realizing after the words left his mouth that he might have just over-explained. Oh, that's a shame. I thought it sounded cute. She pouted. For a moment Izuku internally debated what he was about to do. Do it, don't pussy out. Izuku's patron encouraged in its own way. Why you can call me Deku if you want. Izuku barely managed to squeak out, pleasant surprise lighting up Achako's face. I thought you said it was an insult. She asked as the surprise look shifted to confusion. Well, you said it sounded cute. Izuku floundered for a moment as he searched for the words, so if you used it, I guess that would change its meaning for me. Achako gave the boy a bright smile after a moment of thoughtful posing, Deku it is. So, you any good at English? Achako asked as she pushed past Izuku to enter their homeroom. Luckily for Izuku, class opinions seemed to have ranged from indifference to polite courtesy about his avoiding being expelled. Even Katsuki seemed to have been far calmer than Izuku had originally dreaded, although he did seem to glare at him during each of their classes that they shared. Oh, he is rearing for a fight. Izuku's patron enlightened as the boy took notes in English class. That doesn't seem out of the ordinary for Kachin. Izuku responded, having long since figured out how to hold a conversation with his patron and take notes at the same time. Most of the time he's just angry, this feeling that I'm getting from him, this is rage. Dot 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 huh, what do you think he's mad at? The eldritch being was silent for a moment, Izuku could feel it blinking at him in confusion. There is no way you're that dense. Izuku raised a questioning brow at his patron. Should I know what he's mad at? The answer is you a sput. The godling bluntly said, he's mad at you. But what did I do? Izuku asked, astounded. Blondie's been using you as a measuring stick for his own self-worth, citing your quirkless stature and weak will as enough flaws to place you as a bottom to his hierarchy. Thou whom agony as time explained, you getting into this school at all was enough to throw his worldview off, not to mention the fact that you revealed you have a quirk and showed him up in one of the events yesterday. Oh, was all Izuku could muster, well maybe I won't have to face him in the battle trials today. 
Oh no, you're 100% going to fight him today, the patron casually said. How do you know? Izuku asked, cried at the prospect of fighting his childhood bully. I cashed in a favor with the goddess of fate to specifically arrange for you to fight this guy. Might have also changed up the order of things and who will fight who, but hey. Why did you do that? Because Izuku, this is something that needs to happen for the both of you to grow, the eldritch godling said seriously. Plus it seems this is a fate thing because that was one of the matchups I didn't have to change. If that was supposed to be reassuring, it wasn't. Izuku glumly thought. Don't sweat it, between me, one for all, and that sack of fat in your head called a brain will beat him no problem. Izuku felt the sensation of a pat on the back. Still, Izuku trailed off as his nerves started to get the better of him. All right if you're going to be like that, Izuku felt the full attention of his patron focus on him, the sheer intensity of it making it hard for Izuku to breathe and causing his hands to tremble. Izuku Midoriya, I command you to beat Katsuki's Bakugo's ass in the upcoming battle trial. I do not care how you go about it, but you must defeat him. The intensity faded, allowing Izuku to take several silent gasps of air. Now you don't have to question your ability to beat him, you've been ordered to. Izuku frowned at how cheerful his patron sounded. I'll try my best. Do or do not, there is no try. Go fuck yourself. You know, maybe I haven't been the best of influences. I am here. All Might shouted as he boldly entered the classroom, arriving like a hero. I give it a 6 out of 10. Thou whom agony is time half-heartedly appraised, he could have been a bit flashier. Can you please not do this while my idol is here? Izuku asked as he watched his teacher soak up the praise given to him by the muttering class. I would if he didn't offer me so much to work with, I mean look at how he's walking. The eldritch godling lamented as All Might stiffly high stepped to his podium. Welcome to Heroing 101. This class is where you will be learning the basics of being a professional hero. The boisterous man energetically proclaimed, pulling a card with the word battle labeled on it. Let's get right into it. Time to watch some miners beat the shit out of other miners. Thou whom agony is time sadistically cried in joy. Can you not phrase it like that? Izuku sighed as the emotional whiplash created by All Might's energetic positivity clashed with his patron's darker humor. Would you rather I said, time to watch some miners go at it. Or something like that. Izuku had to fight to keep the blush on his face from spreading too far. No, it would not. Then don't complain, be glad you didn't have to deal with my sister last night. Now whom agony as time chuckled, she would have said things that you'd still be blushing over. So you meet with your sister last night, what did you guys talk about? Izuku asked as he, along with the rest of his class, moved to go to training ground beta. Not much, she just wanted to congratulate me on making a pact with someone after so long, asked me to keep an eye out for any candidates for her to make a pact with, and then to call our parents. The eldritch godling casually explained, speaking of, I should call mom. Have you seen anyone in class one of that could be a good candidate? Izuku asked. You seem strangely fine with the prospect of having one of your classmates make a deal with an otherworldly being. Thou whom agony is time pointed out after a moment of silence. Well, I've done it. Izuku shrugged, much to Ida's confusion next to him on the road to training ground beta, plus if she's anything like you, then whoever makes a pact with her should be fine. Your naivete is strangely refreshing. The patron bluntly said as he marveled at the purity of his servant. She would break you like a Kit Kat bar. Didn't those get banned in 2187 due to being severely cancerous? Izuku shook the stray thought away, should I be worried about the safety of my classmates? Nah, she's intense but only with those who want her to be and she respects limits. The eldritch godling shrugged, doesn't make her any less of a whore though. That's an awfully rude thing to say about your sister. Izuku recoiled at the insult. Says the boy who's only ever been a single child, this is how I show affection for her. Still seems rather rude. Izuku pouted. Trust me, she takes as much as she gives. The eldritch being sighed wistfully, nice costume BTW. Shut up, my mommy made it. Izuku mentally shouted as he raced to catch up with the rest of his class, his costume having been more difficult to get on than he thought. Nice costume Deku. A distorted female voice complimented Izuku, causing the boy to look to its source, which then triggered his face to light up crimson and unknowingly causing the protrusions from his hood to flail. I should have been more specific with my requests, this suit isn't really my style. Izuku would have responded if his brain hadn't nearly shut down at the sight of Achako's form-fitting suit. I love this school. A voice lisped from a few feet away from Deku. What the fuck is that? Thou whom agony is time screeched like a stereotypical 40s housewife that just saw a rat skitter across her floor. Now then, since everyone's dressed let's begin. All Might declared. Sir. Ida's voice cried out from the armored man standing next to Izuku. I was joking about him being a warforged, but he's really not helping me think otherwise. Can you go five minutes without insulting those around me? No, it's a medical condition called assholery. I've heard it's contagious and incurable. Ida continued on with his question, unaware of the conversation taking place next to him. This is the same city from the entrance exam, are we going to be conducting urban battles? Not quite. All Might threw up a peace sign as he struck his 13th dramatic pose of the day, we're going to be going several steps beyond that. Most battles you see on the news take place outdoors, but the truth is most crime takes place indoors. All Might lectured, backroom deals, home invasions, underground lairs, banks would be targets if most money wasn't digital nowadays. 
He laughed. A smart criminal stays out of the light of day and in the shadows. Our exercise today will have your class split into ten groups of two, five of which will be good guys and the other five of which will be bad guys, then each team will face another for an indoor battle. All Might vigorously explained. Isn't this a little extreme? A female student who was dressed vaguely as a frog asked with a raised finger. Oh look, someone finally asked it. Izuku patron snarked. Wasn't when they asked a bunch of teenagers in the ass end of puberty to fight death bots. Wasn't even when they had the discount kaiju. Having a bunch of minors fights each other is where we need to draw the line. You're oddly aggressive today. Is something wrong? I'll tell you later. Focus on your class. All might just finish getting interrupted by half the class. I was listening. Izuku claimed as he returned his full attention to his surroundings. All Might reached into a hidden pocket and pulled out a script smaller than his hand, here's the situation. The villains have hidden a nuclear missile in their hideout, the heroes must foil their plan. To do this, the heroes must either capture the villains or get to the bomb. If they fail to do this, the bad guys win. All Might threw the script into the air, somehow aiming so that it perfectly landed in a nearby trash bin, and pulled up a box will divide the teams based on drawn lots. Isn't there a better way? Ada asked. While well, heroes have to team up at random, why should that be any different here? Izuku asked in turn. I see, life is a random series of events. Pardon my rudeness. Ada bowed to All Might. Kids wrong, y'all are bound to causality and fate. Luckily I got the goddess of such things on speed dial. I'm just going to ignore the existential crisis you could have just forced me into. Izuku deadpan as he moved to draw his team letter. All right. All Might declared as everyone drew their lot. This is how the first round will go. All Might shouted as he reached into two boxes, labeled Heroes and Villains. Team A, consisting of Bakugo and Minta will face Team F, consisting of Midoriya and Achako. Oh, we're on the same team Deku. Achako managed to physically radiate Joy, what are the odds of that? Actually none, this was set up even before I cashed a favor. You're not helping. I need to do well and make a good impression. A moment passed and Izuku was struck by a thought that tripled his anxiety, I'm going to be fighting Kachin. Did you really not believe me earlier? I was more hoping it was an elaborate joke. Izuku explained, causing his patron to sigh. You remember I can eat your emotions, right? Oh yeah. Izuku thought as he allowed his patron to eat his anxiety. We really need to get you some Zoloft or something. Now whom agony as time grumbled as he chewed on the emotions, this is some strong ass anxiety. Team A will be the heroes and Team F will be the villain. All Might declared, everyone else can go to the monitoring room to watch. Izuku looked over to his childhood friend, meeting his intense glare. He felt fear, but it was easier to manage than both the fear and anxiety he would feel under normal circumstances, so he held the look with a determined one of his own. Bakugo looked taken aback for a moment, anger filling his eyes as he let out a small growl. Bad guys head into the building, you have five minutes before the heroes will enter. Use your time wisely to plan. Everyone but Bakugo replied with a yes sir. Got any ideas for a plan Deku? Achako asked as the two walked to where their bomb was situated on the fourth floor. Izuku thought for a moment before responding. Knowing Kachin, he'll go in guns blazing. Izuku started, rubbing a hand against his chin as he thought, so if I could lure him away from the bomb for long enough, we could win by letting the clock run out. But that would also mean you'd be left to deal with that minded guy. Izuku looked to his teammate, I don't know anything about him, so I can really plan anything against him. Leave him to me. Achako said resolutely, a confident smile on her face, he doesn't look that strong, plus I'm sure his quirk has something to do with the weird stuff on his head. He's one of the few people in your class that doesn't seem to have something that's a holdover from the previous era. Now whom agony is time added, even this girl has got something if the way she carries herself is anything to go by. What does she have? Izuku asked as he formulated possible strategies to use against Katsuki. She carries herself like all of the fighters I've seen, and judging by the state of her hands, Izuku glanced at Achako's hands, which seemed perfectly fine to him, she's an amateur running off of talent. Do you think it will be enough against Minta? A retarded puppy would be enough against Minta. Now if she went against Bakugo, she'd be fucked. I think I have a good enough idea. Izuku spoke up, interrupting Achako's own plotting. It's rather simple on your part though. I can fill in the rest if the need be. Achako declared as she struck a pose to try and prove her point, flexing her right arm as she grabbed the bulging muscle with her left. She's got more muscle on her than I thought. Izuku idly thought. Remember Izuku, you can look but don't touch without permission. Izuku's patron sang, causing the boy to light up like a Christmas tree. So should we have a plan or mind asked after several minutes of sitting in awkward silence with the explosive blonde, only to be cut off with a glare, sorry. Here's the plan. That Hugo said after another tense minute, you stay out of my way, and I won't turn you into an oversized glass of grape juice. Mind his eyes widened in terror at the menacing aura the blonde teen was producing, outside of that, do whatever you want. Time's up. Matt start. All Might's voice announced throughout the building. Bakugo let a feral grin split across his face as he kicked the building's door open, blitzing into the building like a mad beast. The hunt was on. The moment All Might's voice announced the start of the match, Izuku began to move. Mage armor, Izuku muttered as he tapped himself on his chest, translucent shadowy magic that held twinkling lights spreading over his limbs, head, and torso. 
Izuku slammed the side of his closed right fist into the palm of his left hand as he stepped onto the second floor, quickly pulling apart the limbs and forming his obsidian black blade that looked much like his patron, a wound in space allowing a glimpse into the unseen cosmos. Deku, Bakugo shouted as both boys turned into opposite ends of the same hall. For an agonizing moment, the two locked eyes. One set filled with rage and contempt, the other with determination and buried fear. Can you make the hex blade blunt? Izuku asked as Bakugo began to stalk forward like a beast hunting its prey, eyes glowing with hatred. Already did, thought you'd hate to cut a classmate. Thou whom agony is time smirked, go wild kid. When Bakugo was at the halfway point in the hallway, both boys moved. Bakugo leaping into the air with his right arm drawn back, Izuku leaping forward into Bakugo's guard as he grasped his hex blade with both hands, going for a horizontal cut. With a Bakugo thought as Izuku slammed his blade into the blonde boy's side, knocking him into the wall. He shouldn't have been able to react that quickly. I can't let up. Izuku mentally shouted as he threw his off hand into the explosive boy's face, ready to snap his fingers, Thunderclaw. Izuku's train of thought was interrupted by a gloved hand grasping his arm and pulling him forward, Bakugo's other hand racing towards the young warlock's face. The resulting explosion knocked Izuku down the hall, his defensive spell blocking most of the damage he would have taken and his homemade mask taking the rest as the front half of it was torn to shreds. Bakugo stumbled to his feet as he regained his bearings, glaring at the subject of his rage. I was planning to knock you out to spare you some pain, but now I'm mad, Bakugo growled through gritted teeth. Kid, you're going to have to use your magic if you really want to hurt this guy. Thou whom agony is time advised as Bakugo hunched over, his breath coming out in ragged breaths. Why? Izuku asked as he went through his list of spells. He's entering a rage, a true proper rage. The patron emphasized, anything physical won't be as effective. Luckily your sword is made of magic but you should still keep him at a distance. I'll try. Izuku's brow furrowed as he watched Bakugo's muscles began to bulge almost unnaturally. Bakugo let out an animalistic roar as he lunged at Izuku again, both arms forward as if he was going to grapple Izuku. The green-haired boy took a step back as he raised his fingers and quickly snapped, thunderclap. Outdoors, the sound would have been significantly easier to handle. But indoors where it could endlessly and rapidly reverberate, it would be unbearable. Bakugo howled as he soared through the air, face scrunching in pain as blood leaked from his ears in a soft trickle. Izuku took the opportunity to wind up his sword, aiming to knock the explosive blonde away like a baseball. At the last moment, Bakugo made an explosion and just large enough to change his course, causing Izuku's swing to miss and stumble forward. The moment it took for Izuku to regain his footing and turn around was enough for Bakugo to land and go for an attack. Shield. Izuku cried, a barrier as wide as the hallway erecting itself in between Bakugo and himself. Bakugo growled in frustration as he slammed his fist repeatedly against the barrier. How long is he going to be like this? Izuku asked as he tried to catch his breath. I'm sure he's been taught the way of the barbarians, so I'm sure it can't last any longer than a minute. How much longer then? 45 seconds. Izuku sighed as he went over his options, making sure to keep an eye on his opponent, who was now using his explosives against the barrier. I'm already halfway through the spells I can use for now, I'm going to have to be careful with how I use the last one. Yeah, I doubt Boombox over here will let you rest for half an hour. Any ideas on how to take him down? Before Izuku could receive a response, the barrier failed. Bakugo's feral grin took a sadistic glint to it as the blonde boy lunged forward a fist drawn back. On instinct, Izuku lifted his sword to deflect the blow as he moved to dodge. The agonizing screech of metal being cut echoed in the room as Izuku stepped past Bakuo, his blade cutting through the outside of the boy's right hand grenade styled gauntlet and taking the lug and safety clip off it along with a third of the protective shell. I thought you said you dulled it. Izuku cried as he looked at his childhood friend, worried about seriously injuring him. I am, but only for you human soft squishy flesh, everything else is fair game. That would have been nice to know. Izuku mentally shouted as Bakugo looked at the now ruined gauntlet and ripped it off his arm. Is that the best you've got Deku? Bakugo growled as he faced Izuku, eyes almost glowing with fury. I'm not scared of you Kachin, Izuku said before his brain could process the thought, I'll beat you and prove that I can become a hero. The green-haired boy took the offensive this time as he leapt at Bakugo, aiming to land a blow on the boy's head. Do you think such a weak move will work against me? Bakugo shouted as he caught Izuku's blade with his right hand, swinging his left to blast an explosion into the green teen's chest. Izuku's grip faltered on the blade as he was knocked back several feet, causing it to disperse in Bakugo's hand. How long have you been hiding this from me, Deku? Bakugo asked in a voice that was far to calm as Izuku shakily rose to his feet, How long have you been trying to make a fool of me? Kachin, I haven't Izuku's eyes widened as a familiar pink form caught his eye, Bakugo spinning on the spot a moment later and letting loose an explosion almost loud enough to hide the feminine cry that followed a moment after. Izuku didn't think as he charged up a spell with a wave of his hand and launched the warbling mass of magic at the back of the distracted blonde, Chaos Bolt. Bakugo raised his arm that still had a gauntlet to defend himself, the armor absorbing most of the force of the blast, shattering it and sending him back to the end of the hallway and crashing out a window. Achako, 
Izuku shouted as he sprinted forward to his fallen teammates, who had pulled herself up and was softly coughing into her hand, and wordly asked, Are you okay? Yeah, she raised her right arm, the wrist piece barely hanging onto the girl's wrist with the exposed skin around it an ugly shade of red, my suit took most of the damage. Villains win, both heroes have been incapacitated. All Might hurriedly said, Hey, we won. Achako tried to sound upbeat but was clearly in pain. Should we get you to the nurse? Izuku asked as he gingerly tried to help his teammate stand. I'd like to see if All Might has anything to tell us first. She chuckled, plus we should go get Minda. Oh yeah, Izuku remembered that there had been another person to worry about other than Bakugo, how did that go for you? The little pervert tried to grope me. She angrily shouted, He's lucky I remembered we were on the fourth floor, or I would have punted him out the window. I knew he was a menace. Thou whom agony is time pipped up. No one asked you. Izuku gave his classmate a nervous smile, I'll go get him, you can get to the monitoring room on your own. Achako gave him a confident nod, even as she cradled her injured arm. Bakugo didn't get me to bad. Well, that's good. See you in a minute. Izuku turned and began the task of climbing the building to retrieve a certain grape-themed midget. We need to drop him down a set of stairs at least once. No, that's not heroic. Fucking lawful good broccoli boy. That has to be the weirdest insult I've heard from you. I want something for helping you with your sword back there. And what would that be? A potato. Why am I even surprised? Trust me, there are weirder things I could ask you for, I'm just trying to be nice. Thank you. No prabo that is just glorious. Izuku's patron interrupted itself when the pair spotted Minda crying tears of pain, hogtied. Why did she have to kick there? The boy wept, of all places, why there? Izuku cringed as he made an educated guess as to where Achako had apparently kicked the boy. Izuku's patron on the other hand, laughed. Props for throwing Bakugo out a window kid. Thou whom agony is time congratulated its servant, causing Izuku to cringe. That was on accident. Izuku mentally muttered as he hurried to catch up to Uraraka on the ground floor. I asked you to beat him, didn't specify how. Izuku's patron chuckled, and you fucking defenestrated the kid. The godling's chuckle developed into full laughter. Can you please stop? I really didn't mean to throw him out the window. Izuku pleaded. All right, the patron said, a smile in his voice, how are you feeling? Pretty good all things considered. Izuku answered confused. I'm asking because you threw some of one for all into that shield spell back there. The eldritch godling's tone took a note of worry, last time you used one for all in a spell you nearly passed out. Well, that explains the numbness in my fingers and toes. Izuku absently thought as he stumbled through the door of the building, allowing the bright afternoon sun to warm his face. Back Hugo, you shouldn't be standing. Your rock has worried voice snapped Izuku out of his blissful trance, you shouldn't even be moving. I'm not done. Bakugo painfully wheezed as he pulled himself up to stand on his unsteady feet. The rage that had filled his eyes during the fight had dulled to burning anger. Bakugo, the match is over. All Might's voice echoed down the street as he landed near the group, and I'd listen to young Uraraka if I were you. Bakugo looked like he wanted to argue, but a massive hand on his shoulder persuaded him otherwise. Dot 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 fine dot dot dot. Do you need assistance getting back to the observation room? All Might asked in a more nurturing voice, it will take transport a minute to get here to take you safely to the nurse. Bakugo's head snapped up as his mouth snarled into the beginnings of an argument. An authoritative look from All Might shut the boy down for a second time. You are going to the nurse, no buts about it. All Might emphasized. I can. Walk. Bakugo began to shuffle in the direction of the observation room. Would one of you please release Minta? All Might asked the two villains of the exercise, turning and leaping back to the observation room. Oh yeah. Izuku shook the fog from his head as he remembered that he was indeed carrying another human. Squish the grape. No, you pussy. You're Raka. Would you happen to have something sharp on you? Izuku asked as he tried and failed to get a good enough grip on the tape to rip it apart without harming Minta. Sure, Uraraka said as she reached into a pocket on her belt and pulled a six-inch butterfly knife from the pouch, flicking it open in a well-practiced Murnax ladder technique before handing it grip first to Izuku. What? She asked as she received a bewildered stare from Izuku and a terrified one from Minta, I checked the rules, they're allowed. Thanks Izuku carefully accepted the blade and cautiously cut Minda free from his bindings, the boy sprinting away as fast as his short legs could carry him the moment he was able to. You don't strike me as the type of person to carry a knife, Izuku said as he watched the brunette repeat the same trick to close the knife and placed it back in her pouch. Oh, I went through a knife phase a while back, she scratched the back of her head as she began the short walk back to the observation room, I guess I never grew out of it. This girl is kinda scary. Thou whom agony is time pipped up, I like her. That's fair I guess, Izuku fidgeted with his fingers, I never really grew out of my hero fanboy phase. I don't think anyone here really did. Uraraka beamed, I don't think any of us would be here if we had. Oh, she has no idea how bad your obsession is. Shut up, studying heroes will help me be a better one. You say that, but I've looked through your computer's files. Izuku's face paled as his patron laughed maniacally, much to the worry of Uraraka. You know, for fanfiction, it's pretty well written. And this is where I tune you out. Izuku thought as he refocused on his conversation with Uraraka, I guess you're right. Seriously, you should post some of your Irisur joke work. It's really well done. I will revoke your internet privileges. No. 
How will I give my growing tweet space audience the shitposts they hunger for? Izuku sighed as he and Yuraka caught up to Bakugo's shambling pace, choosing to follow along behind the injured teen. Bakugo, Ada's worried voice rang as the three disheveled teens shuffled into the observation room. Shouldn't you be going to the nurse with those injuries? Fuck, Bakugo wheezed, off. All Might said it would take a few minutes for someone to come by and safely take him to the nurse, Yuraka explained as the explosive blonde moved to a seat and collapsed next to a red-headed boy with spiky hair. Ah, I see. Ada turned back to the screen, you're just in time to watch Team Z and Jay go up against each other. Usta before Yuraka could finish her question, the video feed switched to an outside view of the building as it was encased in ice. Whoa. Kaminari, Ayama, are the both of you all right? All Might worriedly asked as the video flipped over to the room the two were in on the third floor. Yeah, we're good, Kaminari grunted as he struggled to pull his feet from the frozen floor. Sakur Blue, speak for yourself. Ayama indignantly cried as he struggled to maintain his balance, having been in the midst of a pose when the ground froze beneath him. I am able to continue though. All Might flicked a switch, the match will continue. There's going to be a lot of magic in this fight. Thou whom agony is time chuckled. Oh, this is so not cool. Kaminari thought as he struggled to rip his shoes from the frozen floor, he couldn't even pull his foot out of the damn thing with it completely frozen over. How's it going, Ayama? Kaminari shouted over his shoulder, unable to fully turn to his partner who was unfortunately also facing away from him so that they were back to back across the room. Amon Avis, we are at a serious disadvantage, Ayama grunted as he tried to break the ice off his shoes. Luckily, the both of us don't need to move around too much for our quirks. Kaminari smirked, letting sparks dance between his fingers, you're right about that. Right then Todoroki calmly walked into the room, half of his icy stare hidden behind his ice-themed costume. Looks like Jack Frost is here himself. Kaminari taunted, putting up a front of confidence as his mind raced to find a solution to the problem at hand. Where's your friend? Todoroki didn't react as he walked past them, content on ignoring the two and just grabbed the bomb. On moment as Silvu's plate, Ayama shouted as he fired a beam at Todoroki's back, but I won't tolerate being ignored. Todoroki turned to look at the sparkling blonde and raised a frosted hand at the French teen. As Silvu's plate, would you mind giving up? Ayama asked suddenly. Todoroki blinked as he lowered his hand and seemed to honestly consider doing as the blonde asked, before rapidly blinking and shaking his head. No, the icy teen simply said as he raised his arm and froze a half dome around Ayama thick enough to block his beams from blasting through. Lightning lure. Kaminari grunted as he forced his body to turn as far as it could to see Todoroki, whipping his hand out at the teen as a line of electricity shot at Todoroki. With the arg, the half quirk teen grunted as a physical rope of lightning wrapped around his torso and pulled him towards the smirking teen, electricity painfully coursing through his body. Shocking grasp. Kaminari all but chuckled as he released the lightning lure and tried to grab the passing Todoroki's arm. Suddenly Todoroki's right hand shot up, slamming into Kaminari's chest and encasing the teen's upper torso in ice, effectively slowing him down enough to prevent the blonde teen from touching the dual-haired cryo, Pyromancer. This didn't halt the burst of electricity that jumped from Kaminari's hand from connecting with Todoroki, sending another jolt of coursing pain through the teen as he skidded to a stop five feet away from the immobile blonde. Excuse as moi, but I ask again if you wouldn't mind giving up. Ayama called from within his dome, his voice barely loud enough to carry past the ice. Todoroki didn't hesitate this time as he shook the suggestion from his head, this has gone on too long. He muttered. Todoroki raised his right arm, ice and frost rapidly formed and shot up his arm as he pointed at Kaminari. What is that supposed to be? Some kind of intimidation Kaminari had started to say cockily in the hopes of psyching out the reserve teen, but fell silent as he watched small clumps of ice form in the air around the teen's right side. Snowball storm, Todoroki said in a voice that was barely loud enough to be a whisper as his right eye's pupil seemed to elongate in a reptilian manner and white scales seemed to make themselves known on that half of his face. The floating clump shot forward at breakneck speed, Kaminari only managed to dodge most of the incoming ice through a bit of luck and instinct as he fell backward onto the floor. The fall, combined with his limited mobility from his still-frozen torso and feet, along with the pain from the chunks of ice that had hit him kept Kaminari on the floor. Monsieur Todoroki, you absolute coward. Ayama's voice rang through loud and clear to Todoroki as it felt like someone slapped him. How dare you obscure my sparkling form from the cameras. This is not only an indignity but a tragedy. Todoroki stared at the ice dome that obscured most of Ayama. The icy teen was all but sure the French teen was staring at him through the ice. Todoroki shook his head in disappointment as he walked up to the bomb and half-heartedly placed his hand on the bomb. I got the bomb. Timmy wins. All Might's voice echoed throughout the arena. All Might, sir, are you going to give us an idea of how we did today or are we going to have to wait on that? Yuraka asked as she snapped out of her awe, turning to the American-styled hero behind her. I plan to further go over the recordings of your fights to see any details I may have missed. All Might laughed as he gave a peace sign, although, if any of your classmates were to have constructive criticism or suggestion to make, I'd be remiss to deny the sharing of these thoughts. The room was silent for a moment. 
don't fight Todoroki, Kiro, Hasui said after another awkward moment of silence. Not what I had in mind, but that works. All Might gave the frog girl a thumbs up before turning back to the class holding up his clipboard. I took the liberty to go through and write down the next several matchups during the two other matches wait period. Team C, consisting of Kirishima and Hagakure will face Team H, consisting of Kota and Shoji. All Might announced, causing Kota to shrink into his seat. By now you know the drill. All Might turned and strolled out the door, Kirishima and Hagakure excitedly following suit, Kota and Shoji following at a more sedated pace. This is fight's going to be wild. Now whom agony is time snickered. What makes you say that? The two giants reek of nature, was all the eldritch god said with a snicker. And here are your transceivers. All Might handed each student small wireless communicators. Sir, Shoji said through one of his arm mouths that he formed, neither I nor Kota can properly use these. Kota waved at the part of his head where his ears should be, pointing out the almost smooth skin that couldn't hold such a piece of technology, supporting his partner's claim. That's a shame, would you like to have your match postponed so that we may be able to accommodate this? All Might asked with a frown, he should have planned for something like this. Shoji turned to his partner, Avidich chin eye on heb didif him. He said in a tongue that All Might did not recognize, though Kota seemed to understand it as his eyes widened in surprise. The mountain-headed teen nodded, giving thumbs up with both hands. There is no need to delay our match, Shoji said turning back to All Might who was visibly confused. Well then, go find your bomb. All Might gave a thumbs up as he handed the two a piece of paper describing where the bomb was located. When we've seen that you've done that we'll start the timer for both parties to plan. All Might turned to Kirishima and Hagakure, all set. Hell yeah. Kirishima slammed his fists together in a shower of sparks. All set. Hagakure gave a thumbs up, one of the only visible reactions she could give in her current state of dress. Then I'll be off. All Might said as he crouched and leaped into the air towards the observation room. Shoji and Kota silently going into the building to begin the search of their bomb. Heard of her set of cafes yes have there. Hagakure said after a moment of silence. What? Kirishima asked with a raised brow. I asked you if you had any plans for how to do this. The invisible girl shrugged. Not a clue, I thought about just going straight through and getting the bomb. The red-headed teen scratched the side of his head in thought, although Kota and Shoji both looked like they're packing some serious physical power. Well, while you distract them I could sneak past them and get the bomb. Hagakure suggested after a moment of thought. Sounds like a good idea, Kirishima said with a pumped fist. I wonder how much longer we have until the match starts. Hagakure asked. Match will start in five minutes. All Might's voice rang over the intercom. That was convenient. So where did you learn the druidic ways? Shoji asked in druidic as he and Kota searched the halls of the building for their bomb. My quirk lets me talk to animals. Kota meekly explained after a moment of gathering his thoughts. I guess one of them said something good about me because before I knew it a dry had found her way to me wanting to train me to be a druid. Sounds like a noble way of learning. Shoji nodded his head. How did you learn? Kota asked as he fidgeted with his fingers. Stumbled across a group of druids meeting while I was on a walk. One of them claimed he needed an apprentice. Shoji simply said, They showed me some of their abilities and figured it would help my prospects as a hero. Now I'm his apprentice. Silence fell between the two as they found their room on the fifth floor. How did you know I was a druid? Kota suddenly asked. Shoji simply pointed to the boy's hero costume, where above the teen's heart was the druidic rune for friend. Oh, Kota simply said as he remembered that he put that on his design, earning a chuckle from Shoji. Do you think we should start speaking common, or do you want to confuse All Might some more? Shoji asked as he picked the hollow bomb up easily and moved it to a corner. Common would probably be best if we're going to plan, Kota replied. So here's my plan. Shoji began in common as he set the bomb down. Matt start. All Might's voice called out over the intercom. Not sparing a moment, Kirishima excitedly barged through the door with an excited grin on his face, Hagakure following behind equally excited. The two quickly raced up two flats of stairs, glancing into each room that they passed to check for their opponents. How far up did they put this thing? Hiroshima griped as the two raced up the stairs to the third floor. Shalala, a high-pitched voice cried out. Watch out. Hagakure cried out a warning as the two reached the halfway point of the stairs. Hiroshima had enough time to raise his arms and harden his skin before the large wooden club smashed into him, knocking him back down the stairs. There was a hell of a hit coda. Hiroshima good-naturedly cheered as he pulled himself from the floor, shaking the numb feeling out of his hands. You've got a nasty swing there. Kota visibly relaxed as he saw that Kirishima wasn't hurt too bad from his attack. Pardon me. A high-pitched voice sang as Kota felt someone squeeze past him, a pair of discarded shoes and gloves thrown haphazardly on the stairs. The boy stared at the clothes with a confused look, before his mind made the connection and his face quickly went red. You okay dude? Kirishima asked, popping his knuckles as he ascended the stairs. It wouldn't be very manly of me to fight you if you weren't at your best. Kota shook his head and brandished his club at the shorter teen in an attempt to come off as menacing. Well if you're down, let's go. Hiroshima rushed the taller teen. Kota quickly raised his club in an attempt to cut off the spiky-haired teen's right hook, blocking his line of sight and allowing Kirishima to bury his fist in the taller teen's stomach. The blow knocked the wind out of Kota, weakening his guard and letting Kirishima land a fist on the boy's face, causing him to stumble back. 
Hiroshima moved with Kota, not letting up on the boy as he hammered blow after blow into the titanic team. The two slowly moved backward. Each strike Kota was able to block left him open to two more, and eventually, Kota's back is the concrete wall of the building. Hiroshima relented when Kota slid to the floor, curling up in an attempt to better protect himself. Sorry if I went a little too hard on you, Kirishima apologized as he pulled out the roll of capture tape he had been given, kinda got carried away, wasn't very manly of me. Kirishima had just started to crouch down to wrap the teen's hands when Kota blindsided him with a swing of his club. Dirty trick, but you got me. Kirishima rubbed the side of his face, his smile stuck on his face. Earth tremor. Kota shouted as he slammed his club onto the floor with enough force that Kirishima was surprised it didn't break, almost as surprised when the ground beneath him began to tremble. And it trembled hard. The sudden earthquake caught Kirishima off guard, the force of it knocking him off his feet and causing him to tumble back down the stairs. Ouch. Kirishima hissed as he rolled onto his arms and tried to force himself to stand up as pain spread up his back, his quirk having done only so much to protect his body during the tumble. The sudden weight of a club on his back was a silent warning against him getting up. Heh, looks like you got me. Kirishima chuckled as he felt the capture tape around his waist. So, Kirishima happily cheered as he dragged himself to a wall to lean against. How do you think Shoji and Hagakure are doing? Kota's eyes widened as he remembered that the invisible girl had slipped past him and immediately bolted up the stairs. You're a real chatterbox, you know that. Kirishima joked to the now empty hallway. HM. Hagakure hummed softly and thought as she peered into the bomb room. Shoji was standing alert, his six arms outstretched and with a different sensory organ on the end of each limb. His lowest two arms had ears on them, the middle two had eyes that were looking around rapidly, and the highest set had noses that seemed to be constantly sniffing as he moved them around. Well, that's not creepy, she mused to herself. I know that you're their Hagakure, Shoji suddenly announced, calmly turning his head to look at the doorway the invisible girl was standing in. How'd you find me? She squealed in surprise. The masked boy quirked an eyebrow as he looked where he thought the girl's face would be. How do you know that wasn't just a lucky guess? Hagakure felt her face heat up, glad that her quirk hit her embarrassment on possibly outing herself. Shoji good-naturedly chuckled at the girl's embarrassed silence, the truth is I heard you coming. He wiggled his set of arm ears to demonstrate. Oh, Hagakure muttered as she tried to think of a way around the teen, he had proven that he could hear her but still couldn't see her. She could use that. Agonizingly slowly Hagakure began to tiptoe into the room, using all of her knowledge of stealth to make sure each step was as silent as could be. Slowly and steadily she made her way around the room, sticking close to the wall and maintaining as much distance as she could from her multi-limbed classmate. Shoji's imposing form would be a problem, his back was to the bomb and his arms were spread out enough that he almost was touching the conjoining walls. If she got too close, then there was a risk that he may be able to hear her or accidentally bump into her. But at the same time, her options for distractions were limited. She had left her shoes and gloves downstairs. Her only options were the capture tap and transceiver that she had hidden in her hands. Hagakure maneuvered herself behind a pillar to muffle the sound she was about to make. Hey Kirishima, how quickly do you think you can get up here? She whispered into her communicator. It did little good for the girl as Shoji's head snapped towards the sound that echoed through the silent room like a gunshot. I'm sorry young Hagakure, but Kirishima has been captured. All Might's voice softly replied. Just great. Hagakure muttered. She was by herself and it seemed that even revealing her location didn't seem to be enough to convince Shoji to move. She looked to the wall behind her. It was like the one out in the hallways, covered in plating that had thin gaps in between it. She narrowed her eyes and thought as an idea struck her. Hagakure gently pressed her fingers in the gap between two of the plates on the wall, finding just enough space for her to anchor her fingers. This just might work. She thought to herself as she slowly climbed the wall, both for the sake of stealth and for careful movement as she was barely able to keep a hold on the wall as she climbed up and over to the bomb. She was halfway up and across the wall when Cod burst into the room. The mountain of a teen frantically looked around the room as he made frantic gestures. Mihayima, Shoji said as he raised a finger over his masked face. Her unigef ford y galafi hal reinu trwy sane, feli by to chindal. While Shoji was talking, Hagakure foregoed stealth and leaped towards the bomb. Her grunt of exertion and the sound of skin against metal was loud enough for Shoji and even Kota to hear. I got to bomb. Hagakure cried as she landed on the metal shell with a loud thud. The winner is Team C. All Might's voice echoed around them. Can someone help me down? Hagakure meekly asked after a moment, barely clinging onto the outside of the smooth metal shell of the fake bomb. Well, I'm satisfied. Thou whom agony as time muttered as he watched the four teens leave the building, Kota helping an exhausted and bruised Kirishima as they went. It was a close fight. Izuku nodded his head in thought, although I'm surprised Kirishima didn't win his fight against Kota. I'm pretty sure Kirishima lacks any magical talents. Kota had the advantage there along with his size. And I guess Hagakure jumped over Shoji to get to the bomb. Probably climbed around him before that. On what? Izuku asked. Those walls don't have any place to grip. Well, there are gaps in the plating. Now whom agony is time suggested. Small gaps admittedly, but still gaps nonetheless. I guess I could ask her myself when she gets here. Izuku must write as the door to the room opened. A marvelous battle. 
All Might declared as the four teenagers entered the room, Kirishima leaning on Kota and Hagakure offering peace signs with both of her gloved hands. Does anyone have anything to say to your peers? Hagakure, how did you get to the bomb? Yuraka asked before Izuku could get the question out herself. Oh, I climbed on the wall. The invisible teen cheerfully declared, Turns out there was just enough space in between the plating for me to anchor my fingers. Hiroshima, do you need to go to the nurse? All Might asked as Kota helped the teen over to a chair where he promptly collapsed. Nah, a nap would be great. Hiroshima grinned, I'm going to be sore tomorrow. Fair enough. All Might turned back to the class raising his clipboard, let us move on then. The next fight will be... Team B, consisting of Ajiro and Siro will go against Team G, consisting of Ashido and Asui. All Might boisterously announced, Team B is the heroes and Team G is the villains. Is it me or did he take his time saying that? Now whom agony is time asked as Izuku rapidly went through the list of remaining students. That means Jiru, Takoyami, Ida, and Yayurazu are going to be in the next match. Izuku looked around the room for the students in question. Takoyami seemed to have dragged a chair over to the darkest corner of the room and sat himself there. Jiru was leaning against a wall tapping a beat with her fingers against her arm. Ida was standing at attention, eyes firmly on the screen. Yayurazu was in a similar position a few steps away and far more relaxed than Ida. Do you want me to tell you? Thou whom agony is time asked, cause if you do, it'll cost you. What's the price? I want two more bagels, one cinnamon, and the other raisin. Izuku contemplated the cost and benefits of giving in to his curiosity or not. Before he could come to a conclusion, All Might suddenly shouted, Match start. Hold that thought. Izuku focused on the screen showing Ajiro bursting in through the front door of the test building and Siro climbing the exterior of the building using his tape. My bagels. The eldritch godling shouted before Izuku tuned him out in favor of analyzing the upcoming fight. Ajiro was calm. He softly strode through the silent halls of his test building, listening for even the slightest bit of noise. He knew that him and Siro splitting up would make both easier targets, but the advantage gained from being able to cover the building's area twice as fast was just too good to pass up in his mind. It had also helped that Siro had assured him that the lanky team could hold his own in a fight. Looks like there is a roof access door. Siro's voice crackled through the transceiver that both had received. Good. If you find the bomb, tell me where it is, and I'll meet you there. Ajiro replied softly, I'll do the same. See you in a minute then. Ajiro hastened his steps, they were on a time limit after all. The sickly sound of something coming unstuck was all the warning Ajiro had before a heavy mass slammed into his back, knocking him to the floor. Sorry, Kiro. Asui muttered as she attempted to force the blonde martial artist's hands behind his back and bind them, I hope we can be friends. I should be the one apologizing, Ajiro said, his voice muffled since his face was half pushed into the ground. Kiro, Asui croaked in a questioning tone before Ajiro's tail slammed into her side, successfully knocking her off before she could finish binding the boy. It seems the both of us are guilty of using underhanded tactics, Ajiro said as he pulled himself up, let's have a more honorable fight. She was gone. Ajiro frantically whipped his head around as he searched for the girl. Had he not only taken a few seconds to stand up, how could she silently flee that quickly? Ajiro took a calming breath as he reached inwards, pouring some of his kai into his body as he took a defensive stance and slowly inched back into a wall. With his back to the wall, Asui would be limited in her options of attacking him again. He began inching his way down the hall, straining his senses for any hint of where the frog girl may be. Siro, Asui almost just caught me. Ajiro took a moment to inform his partner of his current situation. There, he figured that making it seem he let his guard down would work, as he sidestepped the plummeting frog girl's form. She's down here on the second floor with me. He continued without taking his eyes off her. Nice dodge. Asui croaked as she crouched down. Thanks. Ajiro was thankful he had decided to utilize some of his limited kai pool, he'd have to use the rest of it sparingly. Suyu blankly stared at the teen, almost unnerving the boy in the dead silence. Another moment passed before Asui lunged at Ajiro, her legs hiding far more strength than he first thought given that he had barely enough time to sidestep her outstretched hands. Gah! He failed to dodge the leg that shot out and caught him in the side as Asui tumbled past Ajiro. Quickly shaking off the discomfort, Ajiro stepped forward and before Asui could react, landed two palm strikes on the girl's stomach and shoulder. Asui rolled backward, using the momentum from Ajiro's attack to push her and allow her some breathing room. Asui's tongue shot out the moment she landed on her feet, striking the stunned blonde before he could react. Ajiro recovered quickly and barely managed to catch the girl's retreating tongue in his offhand. With a mighty heave, the martial artist pulled Asui towards him as he channeled more of his kai into his hand. Ajiro landed three blows in rapid succession, a fourth coming from his tail and striking Asui in the face, knocking her away. Hopefully, that dazed her enough for me to capture her. Ajiro quickly reached for the roll of capture tape in his as he spun to face his opponent again. Damn, Ajiro swore as he looked around, Asui had disappeared again, and to make matters worse he'd blown through half of his kai pool. How much time had passed? 
Did he risk using Morkai against Asui? Should he make a break for Siro and hope to pick off one of their opponents with superior numbers? Siro, what's your status? Ajiro tried to take a calming breath, feeling his Kai start to fluctuate in response to his unstable emotions. A little busy, Siro grunted, the sharp sound of clang bouncing off stone filling the momentary silence he left, Asui a bit more of a problem than first thought. Yeah, she keeps disappearing on me. Ajiro steeled himself, I'll try to take her down as soon as possible and meet you up there. Oh no, take your time. Siro's voice dripped with sarcasm. Before Ajiro could respond, pain shot up his back. Almost on instinct, Ajiro swung his tail at the attacker, twisting his body to fully add extra force. Asui slammed into the hallway wall with a loud thud and slid limply to the ground, like a puppet that had its strings cut. Shit. Ajiro crouched next to the frog girl and began to check to make sure she was okay. I got you, Kiro. Asui's hand shot forward and wrapped a strip of capture tap over Ajiro's arm. Omi dish down, snatch Omi cape low. Asui said into the communicator, confusing Ajiro. The blonde teen couldn't hear the response, but he assumed the answer was no since All Might hadn't called the match yet. Asui turned and dashed down the hallway, leaving Ajiro to stew in his thoughts at his defeat. Ah, uh, she left her capture tape, Ajiro muttered as he noticed the roll of tape still attached to the segment wrapped around his arm. He didn't notice the missing weight of Inazgi until the match had ended. Son of Asiro cut himself off mid-swear. Ashida was being more of a handful than she had a right to be after several minutes of the two playing cat and mouse. He pulled a blunted kunai out from a leg pouch and threw it neat the bomb and darted in the opposite direction. He was halfway to another pillar to hide behind when he felt a burning sensation on his leg. That's not going to work helmet boy. Ashido cheerfully cried Ciro's head snapped towards the source of the sound only to find the space empty. I'll let you have one last try though. Ashido's voice was low in the teen's ear. Ciro whirled around to catch the pinket, only to find her gone. You have till the count of three to hide, then I'm coming after you. The girl's voice was far too cheery. One, Ciro shot a strand of his tape at the ceiling and used it to pull himself up and further adhere himself to it. Two, Ashido drew out the number as Ciro tried to silently and hastily make his way over to the bomb. Three, the playfulness in Ashido's voice disappeared, sending a shiver down Ciro's spine. Now where, oh where could he be? Ashido asked as she walked into the center of the room and slowly looked around, seemingly unaware of the teenage boy above her. She's bathing me. Ciro thought, I just know it. I need to get to the bomb, time's running out and I don't know when Ajiro will get here. Ciro thought rapidly, but surely Ashido didn't just leave me an open path to the bomb without something planned. Ciro looked down at the pink girl directly beneath him. But she's probably also got a plan to defend herself if she's being so brazen about this. Fuck it. Ciro mentally shouted as he fully rejected stealth and leaped at the bomb. Gotcha. Ashido shouted the moment Ciro began to move, lobbing a glob of acid that she had been forming in her hands at the soaring teen. Shit. Ciro's course had been knocked off by the blob of the thankfully weak acid, knocking him to the floor. Ciro could feel it eating away at his suit as he pushed himself to his feet and sprinted towards the bomb. Nope. Ashido slid past Ciro and stopped in front of him. Before Ciro could stop or slow down, Ashido began splattering her acid on the ground in front of him, leading him to slip and fall. Ouch. Ciro thought in a daze, absently aware of his hands being pulled in front of him and bound. Team G wins. All Might's voice echoed throughout the building. Who would have thought that Ashido was good at being stealthy? Izuku idly thought to himself, I barely saw most of her fight. Yep, stealth battles aren't very fun to watch when you're in the group that's being stealthed against. Thou whom agony is time agreed. What? No witty insults for any of those fights. Ask me in a minute, I want to focus on this next fight. What's so special about this next fight? Outside of the fact that this could be nightmarishly one-sided. You don't know how it's going to go down. Do you? Maybe. Now whom agony is time trailed off as he broke into maniacal laughter. After ten seconds of continuous maniacal laughter, the four teens re-entered the room, Ajiro and Asui were both limping lightly while Siro seemed to be lamenting his ruined costume. The only one of the four who was in a good mood was Ashido. Ah oh, fake pop Siro, you did fantabulosa, Ashido said, lightly pushing Siro's shoulder and confusing much of the room. Any comments or words of wisdom to share with either of our teams? All Might gestured towards the four teens in question. The room was silent for a moment. Then we shall move on to our final match of the day. All Might declared, Team D, consisting of Takoyami and Jiru will face Team I, consisting of Eda and Yayorazu. Oh, so that's who the teams are. Yep, and depending on how far the two of them are willing to go will affect just how one-sided this matchup is. Maybe the opposing team's quirks and teamwork will balance it out. Quirks can only do so much in the face of magic Izuku. Oh, Izuku focused on the screen, anxiously waiting to see the fight that his patron was so sure was already decided. And here are your communicators. All Might dropped the earpieces into Jiru and Takoyami's hands. I hope they won't be a problem for you young Takoyami. The bird-headed teen looked down at the tiny technology and shrugged, casually placing the device underneath his feathers where his right ear should be. Well, whatever works. All Might gave a thumbs up before turning and handing another set of earpieces to Ida and Yeyurazu. Your five minutes will start when you find the bomb, try and hurry. All Might turned and leaped from the group. Ida and Yeyurazu swiftly entered the building a moment later. So, what's with the edgelord get up? 
Jiro asked after a moment of silence. Takoyami glanced at his teammate out of the corner of his eye. I and my powers are tied to the dark, so I have embraced it wholehearted and let it permeate my being. Takoyami finally said as he lowered his head. So, you're goth. Jiro asked without skipping a beat. I am far more than just a goth. Takoyami firmly stated. Super goth. Jiro smirked as she noticed the boy twitch in frustration. Perhaps we should discuss our plan rather than which one of the petty labels best fits me. Takoyami changed the subject with a hint of frustration. All right, I can pretty well track them with my quirk. Jiro lifted her ear jacks for emphasis, then pointed at her boots. I'm also packing some base for offense. Takoyami looked down at the smaller girl's large boots, noticing for the first time the speakers built into them. Spill it nevermore. What's your quirk that's tied with the dark or whatever you said? Jiro asked with a lifted brow. Please refrain from calling me that again. Takoyami sighed as a mischievous spark lit in Jiru's eyes. In my body, I house a monster of shadow and rage who grows in ferocity and power in the dark. Can I see it? Jiru asked. Fine. Takoyami sighed as he pulled his cloak open. Sup. Dark shadow lifted an arm as it popped free from the young bird teen. Ah, he's so cute and small. Jiru reached out and stroked the top of the smaller bird shadow's head. Hey, I can get much bigger than this. The shadow tried to defend itself even as it blushed at the attention Jiru was giving it. I swear, this usually never happens. And that's enough out of you. Takoyami closed his cloak as he pulled his quirk back into him. Do you possess any insight as to our enemy's abilities? Nope. Jiro shrugged. Judging by prep boy in those legs and suit I'd guess he's probably an up-close and personal kind of guy. HM. Takoyami hummed in thought. I wager the inverse could be said of Yeirazu, or her quirk has something to do with skin contact. What are you, a perv? Jiro asked in a deadly serious voice. Why I would never I only meant it's only logical Takoyami sputtered as he tried to form an appropriate argument, only stopping when Jiru couldn't restrain her laughter anymore and almost fell to the floor gripping her sides. Dude, she gasped out as she attempted to recompose herself, you need to relax a little, it was only a joke. Takoyami looked away indignantly as he fought a growing blush that he worried would show through his feathers. As I was saying, Takoyami continued, trying his best to ignore the previous part of the conversation. It seems that an appropriate plan for the two of us would be to have you track our opponents and allow me to deal with the both of them, Ida being the main focus if both end up being far stronger than anticipated. Rockin, Jiru nodded as she considered the plan, I can provide support from the back, and if I see an opening, I'll make a beeline for the bomb. And now we must wait for fate to decree our conflict has come. Takoyami leaned against a nearby railing as he spoke, content to brood in the cheerful sunlight. Matt start. All Might's voice cried out from the speakers a moment later. Looks like that's now. Jiro snickered as Takoyami hastily rose and almost glided towards the door. Well, they're not on this floor. Jiru grumbled for the third time as she pulled herself up from the floor. Then we will ascend to the next. Takoyami turned and moved towards the stairs. How far up do you think they will? Jiru had been in the middle of her question when Takoyami had shoved her roughly out of the way of the stairwell door. Now we're having fun. Dark Shadow cried gleefully as it held Ida upside down by a caught leg. Shocking grasp. Ada grunted as he slammed his right hand onto Dark Shadow, blue electricity dancing off his fingers. Bitch. Dark Shadow recoiled at the light, choosing to chuck Ada further up the stairs. That stung you know. Do I look like I care pathetic heroes? Ada said in a voice that was clearly trying to be intimidating. Why are you talking like that? Jiru asked nonplussed. I am a villain, how else am I supposed to talk? Ada stuttered in his real voice, shaking his head he corrected himself in his villainous voice, emphasizing the point with a slam of his staff. I mean, this is how I usually talk hero. Jiro glanced at Takoyami out of the corner of her eye, hoping to get some confirmation that she wasn't just imagining the other boy's eccentricities. If that is how you wish to play villain, then so be it. Takoyami stepped forward as he dramatically tossed his cape open, declaring this day shall mark the end of your life of crime. Oh great, you're doing it too. Jiro's complaint went unacknowledged by either of the two males. Just try me bird brain. Ada taunted as he pointed at Takoyami, internally cringing at what he thought was a stinging insult. True sight. Takoyami chose not to respond as Dark Shadow lunged forward at the armored teen. Ida leaped backward, allowing the shadowy beast to slam into the stairs where he had been standing. Ida gracefully landed on the landing above the group, rushing forward the moment his feet touched the stone in a mad dash towards Takoyami. Cover your ears, Jiru commanded as she pushed past Takoyami and into Ida's path, plugging her ear jacks into her boot speakers. Takoyami barely had enough time to cover his ears before an obscenely loud rhythmic beating blared from the smaller girl's boots. The sheer force of the sound threw Ida off balance, let alone the pain that followed from nearly having his ears blown out. This led to the unfortunate situation of Ada completely losing his balance as he slammed into the stair railing and tipped over. Shit! Jiru cried as she unplugged her jacks and rushed over to the railing. Takoyami went a step farther and hastily sent Dark Shadow after the blue-haired teen in the hopes of avoiding serious injury. He ain't down here boss. Dark Shadow shouted up at the heroic team as he looked up at them. What do you mean he's not down there? Takoyami shouted back in frustration. I mean, I don't see him down here. Dark Shadow shouted back as the same note of frustration entering his voice. 
Well then, where is he? Jira was sure she could see a vein bulging in the birdman's neck. Hell, if I know. Dark Shadow shrugged as he floated back up to the two. Maybe ask the babe with echolocation. It's not echolocation, Jiru argued with a faint blush on her face as she stabbed an ear jack into the ground. Jiru's eyes narrowed as she strained her hearing for any sign of the bespeckled team. I think he's somewhere on the first floor but I'm not sure where. Dark Shadow can watch out back as we continue forward, Takoyami said as Dark Shadow shrunk and rested its head over the teen's shoulder. That's kinda cute. Jiru chuckled as Takoyami turned and continued up the steps, walking around the damaged segment caused by his quirk. I am a raging member of the Creatures of the Night, a throbbing example of a nightmare incarnate. Dark Shadow raged, directly into Takoyami's ear no less, I'd keep her up all night screaming if she saw how monstrously large, I truly am. Shut up. Takoyami bellowed as he smacked the shadow in the head. Jiru, on the other hand, was struggling to contain her laughter at the contrast that the two created. I failed to catch either of them. Hedda solemnly spoke into his communicator, you have my deepest apologies. Don't worry about it, we have a backup plan, remember. Yayurazu placated, besides, you can still try and sneak up on them. Ida was silent for a moment, it'll be a challenge, but I shall try. That's what I expected from an edger strong, you simply must teach me feather fall sometime. Yayurazu chuckled as Ida sputtered. You should probably get moving, the hero team's probably already halfway through the fourth floor. Right. Ida seemed to compose himself enough to begin his task. Yayurazu silenced her mic as she thought aloud, he really needs to relax. All right, she has to be on this floor, Jiru grumbled as she stepped onto the fifth floor, Takoyami trailing behind her. She stabbed her jack into the ground again as the two paused. Found her. Jiru almost cheered. They wasted more than enough of their time just climbing the stupid building. Then let us commence this mad banquet of darkness. Takoyami gravely said, lead the way. How many Linkin Park albums do you own? Jiru idly asked as she moved forward. All of them, but I prefer my chemical romance if we're talking about that era of music, Takoyami replied honestly, almost causing Jiru to choke in surprise. What? My word, you really are an emo. She wheezed out. I'll have you know, I find their music speaks to me on a far deeper level than the trash that's out today. Takoyami tried to defend himself. I'll agree that modern music is trash, Jiru wiped a tear from her eye, but we need to talk music sometime. If you insist. Takoyami sighed. The two walked in silence for a moment before stopping at a door. Jiru stabbed her jack into the wall and listened for a moment. This is it. Jiru pointed at the door and took a step back. Takoyami nodded as he stepped forward and flung the door open. Boom. Only to be met with a face full of net fired almost point blank from a cannon. Son of a Jiru swore as she covered her unprotected ears. Bitch. Dark Shadow shouted as it flung the net off him and Takoyami. That hurt you know. Oh, I know, you should be glad I wanted to humiliate you heroes instead of killing you, Yayurazu said in a bad imitation of Midnight as she pushed the cannon out of the doorway and stepped into it. Why did I let him convince me to do this? Oh god, not you too. Jiru cried in anguish. Your hubris will be your downfall wrench, Takoyami growled as he lifted himself. The only one who will fall today is you. Yayurazu twirled a bow staff in one hand, the weapon seeming to hum just quite enough to escape the perception of most of those in the room. Magic missile. Yayurazu whispered as she pointed at Takoyami with three fingers. A pink glowing dart shot out of each finger not a moment later and slammed into dark shadow as the teen used his quirk to shield himself. Fucking oh. The quirk cried as the bolts dug into his being. What the fuck is in that? Wouldn't you like to know? Yayurazu tried to taunt, taking a swing at Jiru when she moved to blast the ponytailed teen with her base boots. Take this. Jiru slammed her jack into her boots and blasted her accelerated heart rate at Yayurazu. Much like with Ida, the force of the sound had been enough to knock Yayurazu off balance. A fact that Dark Shadow took full advantage of. Got you now. Dark Shadow cried as it lunged at Yayurazu. Recipro burst. Ida cried as he came barreling down the hall, a jump kick aimed at Takoyami. Shit. Dark Shadow cried as it was carried with its owner, the bird's head teen flying down the hall from the force of the Ida's blow. Jiru cut off the sound from her speakers to reposition herself to blast at the new foe, but Ida was faster, barreling into her with a lung and knocking them both to the ground. Ida was moments away from binding Jiru's hands behind her back when a rage-filled scream echoed down the hall. Fuck this bullshit. Dark Shadow shouted as it shot up to the ceiling and began shattering lights with reckless abandon. What on earth is he do? Ada began to ask as the hallway beyond them was quickly filled with darkness, a shadowy fist slamming into the armored teen and throwing him back down the other end of the hall. Dark Shadow, calm down. Takoyami's voice held a note of fear as the sound of thrashing echoed from the hall. Jiru, go after the bomb. Got it. Jiru cried as she forced herself off the ground, only to get knocked back down by a blow from Yeyurazu. Stay down. She barked, losing some of her already unstable villainous persona. Pressed to digitation, Yeyurazu muttered, a small shower of sparks raining down where she thought Takoyami was. She raised four fingers as she made out the outline of the now enlarged dark shadow, magic missile. Four bolts shot from her fingers as they sailed into the shadowy mass of Takoyami's quirk. You fucking piece of shit. Dark shadow bellowed as it turned to the young heiress. I may have made a poor decision. 
Hiyarazu thought before Dark Shadow's hand shot out and dragged her into the dark. Jiru hesitated for a moment before blitzing into the villain's room and slamming her hand onto the hollow metal bomb. Team D wins. All Might's voice echoed throughout the building. Dark Shadow calmed the fuck down. Takoyami's voice echoed a moment later. Hut, so this is what it feels like to be wrong. Thou whom agony as time sounded like a gunshot in the silent room to Izuku. The entirety of Class 1 was staring in shock at the screen. All Might had left minutes before to go and attempt to calm down the rampaging Dark Shadow. It hadn't been the fact that Takoyami had lost control of his quirk and revealed just how powerfully it could be that had stunned the class. It was the fact that All Might had knocked the beast out in a single blow and taken out that side of the building that had stunned the class. I am here, All Might declared as he kicked the door in, carrying a now unconscious Takoyami over one shoulder and a shivering Yeyurazu in a one-armed bridal carry in his other arm. What? All Might asked as the class stared at the giant man. Do I have something on my face? The class didn't respond. Well, good heavens look at the time. All Might cried as he looked at a wall clock. It feels like we've been here for weeks. You all need to go prepare for the rest of your classes. I'll make sure to give you all evaluations of your fights in the coming days. Till then I'll take these two to the nurse's office. All Might quickly exited the room, placing his trust that the class of 10th graders could functionally find their way back to the main campus. That is a very trusting man. Now whom agony as time commented as the class silently shuffled to the locker rooms to change and continue their school day. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku becomes Hexblade Hero. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Skeptical One for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.